Good evening and welcome um, to Pajaro Valley Unified School District Governing Board of Directors meeting for uh, <coughs> Wednesday, I'm sorry, let me help remind me, uh, February 28th. We are, I'm calling this meeting to order at 7.56 p.m. <clears throat> so welcome to the PBUSD board meeting. We have translation in Spanish. If you need that support, please see our very own Yorena Lopez. Bienvenidos a la reunión de la Junta Directiva del PBUSD. Despenemos de transición en español. Si necesita ese apoyo, consulte Yorena Lopez. Mm -hmm. um, so, I also see lots of new faces here this evening, which we um, do appreciate and enjoy. So I want to take a moment to establish some ground rules. There may be differences of opinion, sometimes strong differences. So please give those speaking the same respect that you would like to receive when you are speaking. This will allow everyone to be heard and the board to conduct its necessary business. I'm going to move to item 3.2, the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm going to ask Vice President Soto to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Vice President Soto. I'm going to now move to item 3.3, our superintendent comments, and um, I'm going to ask Superintendent Sheckman to make his comments now. Thank you. Thank you, President Costa and board, and thank you for the large crowd tonight. Uh, actually, my comments tonight are all about thank you. How many of you folks, and I know a lot of you, were there on Saturday at Watsonville High? Really appreciate it. Thank you, AFT. You paid the bill for 40,000 books to be donated. We had hundreds of volunteers. The truck that came in on Monday, we started unloading on Wednesday. Uh, lots of kids from Watsonville High, lots of teachers, lots of administrators, most of the people in the back of the room, and a lot of you moved the books over Friday, opened up on, I don't know why I'm standing, op opened up on, uh, on Saturday, and it was just perfect. It was just, uh, just think now that all those books are in homes around our community. And really, it was just a, it's a little tight, I said that in my thank you, but it really was a village that did this. Next door, some of you may have gone over and visited. We had over 200 individuals keep their teeth clean. We had one guy had his, uh, a tooth pulled. Cal Heels is a nonprofit in the state of California that brings in volunteers. And we had volunteers from Southern California. It was really successful to put the two together. Nellie, I, I know you're here. Oh, so Nellie, yeah, I really appreciate the leadership. She and I started planning a long time ago. Now she, she's thinking about becoming a principal. I know she still needs to earn the credentials, but I'm partly kidding. She did say something to me. But I really appreciate the leadership and the hard work that everybody did. Yep, that's my message. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Sheckman, and I'm sure it was a wonderful event. Sorry I missed it. Um, now we are going to move to 3.4 governing board comments reports on standing committees. This is an opportunity for each board member to take a few minutes um, to comment on um, the activities they've been going through and uh, committee meetings. And we are going to start with our very own student trustee. Thank you, President Acosta. And good evening to everyone here. Thank you for being here today, tonight. Um, these last months, the board has heard from the community time and time again with the same mission to bring back the CRE contract. As a representative of students in our district and also as an ethnic studies student, I feel the urgency to continue to advocate and emphasize to the board the importance of making decisions that align with the community needs and to bring back the renewal of the contract. Thank you. Thank you to our student trustee and I will now call on Trustee Bolano Scout.
Thank you, Trustee Palanascal. Trustee Dr. Holm. Good evening, everyone. I, I did attend uh, several committee meetings, but just given the lateness of the hour, I'm going to waive my comments for now. Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. Trustee DeSerpa. I'll, I'll be similar. Thank you. I'll yield my comments. Trustee Dodge Jr. I, I would just like to, to briefly, quickly say thank you, Nellie, uh, PVFT, AFT, CFT volunteers, all the the dentists, medical assistants were there that day, all the people that donated books, and I was able to celebrate the to attend the event uh, the, to celebrate the life of Mas Hashimoto. Um, Mas Hashimoto is a, a lifelong Wattsville resident and historian, a teacher, and a great story of perseverance. He's seen the ups and downs of Wattsville. And if you're interested in history, I please look at Mas Hashimoto, and he tells a great story. So thank you, Mas, and Marcy, I think. Thank you to both of them, and thank you, Trustee Dodge Jr. Th Trustee Flores. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, I wanted to uh, say thank you to PBFT for the literacy fair. It was amazing. My daughter and I did attend. Um, it was a lot of fun. I loved seeing all the high school students out there also putting in their community service hours. Um, thank you Extended Learning for having um, the section outside of the cafeteria. That was a lot of fun. The physics bus was interesting to go through with my daughter. Um, and also I was able to attend the CAC meeting last night um, and uh, we had a very great um, informational meeting uh, presented to us but about the LCAP and how important it is for us to give our input as parents and as community members. And so if you are able to um, fill out the Youth Truth Survey, and we also will have a survey for the LCAP. And that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Flores. Vice President Soto. All right, I'm going to say my usual beginning part. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Good evening. Uh, I just want to take a moment and acknowledge my colleagues. Uh, we've had an arduous month, and we're going to continue to have one tomorrow night. Um, We've had an incredible display of disagreement on certain topics, which is healthy uh, conversation, you know, among the society, among people. But I saw in my colleagues uh, the ability to come together to make a decision, and um, I want to acknowledge all of you tonight for that. So, Trustee Scow, Trustee Holm. Trustee DeSerpa, Trustee Dodd, Trustee Flores, and President Acosta. Uh, I want to thank you, you know, to display the ability to, to show some cohesion when uh, we need to make important decisions, and I appreciate that in all of you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Soto. Um, so um, we are sorry that we had to start late. Um, the board actually does need to reconvene to close session at the end of our public session. So I do have a few comments. Um, one, I did attend the Adult uh, Education Advisory Committee meeting along with our Superintendent Shackman. It was great to see so many local, state, and federal leaders in attendance and interested in seeing what we are doing here at PBUSD with adult education. Unfortunately, I will not be able to attend this month's Migrant Seasonal Head Start Policy Committee meeting tomorrow, and neither will my colleague, Trustee DeSerpa, since the Governing Board of Directors will be having a special board meeting on declining enrollment tomorrow night here in this room at 6 p.m. Um, my third uh, comment announcement is that after months of defining a process com and with community stakeholders' input and numerous governing board meetings. The governing board of directors of Pajaro Valley Unified School District have identified a finalist for the superintendent of Pajaro Valley Unified School District and there will be more information coming soon at a later date. And in my last comment, I just want to take a moment to extend my deepest gratitude to our PBUSD community. So many members of our PBUSD community have reached out to me and my family extending us their sympathy and condolences at the passing of my mother this past week. For nearly 40 years, my mother's working life and career, she was a classified school employee, 
as a school bus driver and a licensed and certified school bus driver instructor by the state of California. I cannot possibly begin to count the numerous students that arrive safely to school and return safely at home at the end of their school day due to my mother's direct impact on her work for nearly four decades of her life. I just want to thank again to all of you who have reached out to me and my family, offering us your condolences and deepest sympathy. It is greatly appreciated and a wonderful testimony to our great QESQ community here in the Park Valley, and I thank you all. I'm going to now move to item 3.5, High School Student Board Trustees Report, and I believe we have a report from um, Diamond Tech Institute. It's a recording. Thank you. Good evening, President Acosta, Board of Trustees, and Interim Superintendent Murray Shackman. I'm Orion Duran, and I'm excited to catch you up on everything we've been doing since our last report. We ended our first semester with our annual Adopt-A-Family. We were able to bring holiday cheer to two families this year. Thank you to all students and families who contributed. Over the winter break, our Ethics Bowl team competed in a debate-style forum at UCSC. And although we didn't place in the top, our team did really well and we're proud of our White Tigers. Our character education theme for the third quarter is to be encouraging. This character trait reminds us to help build each other up and that together we can do big things. As always, we started our 2024 semester with community team building and pancakes. We also awarded the winners of our first semester project for Beast Battle and College Career Expo at uh, ePortfolio Expo. Beast Battle is a school-wide project that incorporates agro science, engineering, and digital media. We have a few projects for Beast Battle that will be moving forward with their entry for the County STEAM Expo. We also awarded those students who showed excellency in their ePortfolios. Students had to show mastery of professional content as well as MOC interview. Between the two projects, students were awarded over 3,800 in scholarships. We also recently celebrated 10 Diamond Techies who are selected to show off their filmmaking skills at the Watsonville Film Festival. Showing will be at Green Valley Cinemas at 11.30 on March 9th. Congratulations to our student directors. We started the next round of project-based learning, and we are currently in the middle of our national directing change submissions. These short films are about mental health and suicide prevention. Last year, we had two submissions recognized from this national organization, and we are hoping to have more this year. We are also working on our social media and marketing challenge. Last year, our client was a beach boardwalk, and this year we are working with the Santa Cruz Community Credit Union to engage the community in their program. We are the only school participating from, from Santa Cruz County, and we're hoping to do a great job again this year. Coming up soon is our annual business boards, held in the Mellow Center on March 28th. This is a great DTI heritage project. Mark your calendars and come see it, or better yet, be a judge for this event. Just scan this QR code and fill out the information. I'll give you a minute. Great. We look forward to seeing you there and showing you our latest business innovations. It was great to celebrate Valentine's Day this year. We had some great lunchtime activities and lots of participation. Even Mr. Licata joined us in the fun Teacher Ken. Don't forget to follow us on social media and thank you again for this opportunity to share what we've been doing at Diamond Tech. And our next report will be from Pajaro Valley High School. Good evening, President Acosta, Superintendent um, Mr. Sheckman, and the members on the board, and lastly, our student trustee. For Black History Month, this year, our Black Student Units, along with the Multicultural Committee, prepared many different activities to shine light on Black History Month. Our, teacher participated, our teachers participated in decorating their door to celebrate aspects of Black History with colorful and informational posters. This year's theme on our Instagram page was to highlight inspiring black figures stating. Our main focus for this event was to remind people that black history is American history. For Senior Panoramic, as the months get closer to graduation, the senior class had their Senior Panoramic. Every year joins in this picture as a remembrance, a memory we carry as we move on to a new chapter. For the love of the game Spirit Week, 
From February 13 to 16, we introduced our third Spirit Week of the school year. For the love of the game, Spirit Week. We kicked off the week with our love for comfort, where we wore our favorite PJs. For the love of yourself was next. We were various Valentine accessories and colors. Following that, we had for the love of your favorite team. Whether it was a basketball, football, or even a school jersey, we were showing them off. Lastly, we had for the love of your district, where we were our class colors. Next up, we have on February 16th, which we had a third rally of this year for the love of the game. In our rally um, schedule, we had very, various games as Hungry Hungry Hippos, Musical Chairs, Tug War, which staff and students have both participated in. We had a couple of performances, such as for Cortico Performance, Cheer, Band, and Color Guard. Um, we assist, assist the um, classes based off the performance of during the week and student participation in success in the games and also the quality of the yells. Particularly, senior class emerged as the leaders, following by the sophomore class in second place, the junior class in third, and the freshman class in fourth. Next up, we have athletics. On January 30th, we had girls soccer held a senior night and also made a CCS. On February 9th, boys soccer held a senior night out on the field. And on February 8th, we had girls basketball senior night in the gym. And lastly, on February 12th, we had boys basketball senior night along with side cheer. And for our after school events, on Friday, February 16th, we organized our Noche de Banda dance. This spectacular event unfolded on our patio beneath the enchanting night sky. The students had the opportunity to revel in the music provided by a DJ and a live band performance. Next up, we have Expandly, which we'd like to thank. A sweet sheet and cotton candy. Despite the rainy weather on February 14th, we managed to have some enjoyable moments with cotton candy and friends after school, thanks to the event organized by Expandly again. And we also had our after school annual tie-dye. In, pre in preparation for our rally, we engaged in a tie-dye activity to create a distinctive rally shirt. For the freshmen opted for purple tie-dye, the sophomores went for pink, and the juniors chose orange and seniors tie-dye the shirt screen. We appreciate the chance to add a, a, new, a unique touch to our attire. Hello, hello. Good evening. So um, next up, we have our after school um, painting night with Judy Gittleson. Great, great, great. Uh, we hosted a paint night that attracted uh, many students. Uh, all the necessary materials were provided, allowing students to paint a backdrop of their choice. Uh, it turned out to be a fantastic experience for many, even with those that have not really a good amount of experience. But you know, looks so cute. With everyone having a great time and producing impressive artwork. Next we have our 2023 winter concert. On December 11th, um, our band class um, announced a winter concert with various groups um, to prepare for the holiday season. Um, we had mariachi, we had a clarinet choir, a piano and violet duet, and much more. A lovely night to spend with friends and family as you listen to many holiday songs. I was actually there to support some of my uh, friends and my sister. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and then next up, we had uh, last Friday um, after school, we held a Jamba Juice fundraiser uh, where proceeds went to ASB. This was a successful fundraiser uh, in which we sold out and had good feedback from many students and staff. We have chosen to have them back bi-weekly till the end of the year. Um, that was really good. But I wish I had some. Sadly, I couldn't. For our Grizzly highlights. Um, a group of students in our entrepreneurship class 2 were tasked with, a sm with creating a small business. Rose Ever, a extern internal flower bouquet business. Since getting started, they have appeared on the news, attended conferences and workshops to expand the business. We do have their QR code to their Instagram linked on the screen for anyone who would like to support their business. Um, we would also like to highlight our mock trial. Despite this being their first year as a PBHS mock trial team, by the end of the season, they have received astonishing awards for their participation and work. Jocelyn Gomez received her award for being an astonishing prosecution attorney. Ricardo Vega for astonishing prosecution witness. The team as a whole, the team as a whole, including teacher, teacher coach Eric Hutchison and attorney coach Jason Gill, won an award for amazing sportsmanship. The Pal Marigon Mock Trial Award, presented by the Santa Cruz County Trial Award Association.
We would also like to highlight some of our athletes. David Hernandez received a PCAL First Team All League patch for cross country. For his astonishing accomplishments, he finished eighth place in the Santa Lucia Division at PCAL Championships and holds three school records. As highlighted before, girls soccer made it to CCS this year for their amazing accomplishments, for their hard work, despite the lack of sunlight in the evening practices and having to wake up early for morning practices. As well as our two wrestlers made it to CCS, Jose Perez and Jocelyn Santana. We're extremely proud of our Grizzly and their accomplishments. Finally, we made a give up. EAOP and our counseling department have been holding financial aid workshops to help out our students with the FAFSA applications because we all know that there have been many complications this year with this New Year's format. As we get closer to March, we also like, we also like to get closer to our um, college decision results. We wish all the seniors the best of luck with their results. We'd like to thank you guys for inviting us today to present to you. Thank you for her Valley High School. Um, I'm going to now move to um, item 4.1, approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda? Move to approve. Second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Uh, can I have a motion to approve, moving, I'm sorry, to item 5.1, approval of the February 14th, 2024 board meeting minutes, Valentine's Day. We didn't have dinner plans. Can I have a motion to approve the board meeting minutes for February 14th, 2024? I move to approve. Second. I have a, I have a, she beat you. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Um, approval, I'm moving to item 5.2. Approval of the February 17th, 2024 special board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion to approve that? Was that Soto? Belanosco? A scow, I'm sorry. So sorry. <laughs> I have a first and a second. All those in favor? I'm sorry, they were waiting for me. And then uh, moving to item 5.3, approval of the February 18th, 2024 special board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? Move to approve. Thank you, Trustee DeServa. Can I have a second? Thank you, Trustee Dr. Holm. All those in favor? I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Perfect. Thank you. We will now move on to item 6.1, public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address the issues that are not on our agenda for this evening. Please note that through the Brown Act, we are prohibited, the board, from engaging in discussion for non-agendized items, but we do want you to know we are listening. Do we have any public comments? Yes, we do, President Acosta. We have 18 for the evening on 6.1. Uh, first three, I will call you up, and then uh, everybody subsequently in uh, pairs or groups of threes as well. So the first three, uh, Laura Hunter, Bernard Gomez, and Karina Moreno. Moreno. Good evening, members of the board, Superintendent Sheckman, and esteemed community. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Laura Hunter, and I'm proud to serve as an education specialist at Pajaro Valley High School, where I teach modified math and chemistry. Tonight, I stand before the board to underscore the critical importance of the new teacher supports that have played a pivotal role in my professional journey. In the upcoming season, I urge the board to recognize and preserve these support systems. They not only facilitate the growth and success of us educators, but also contribute significantly to our overall well-being. Please also consider that the new teacher project be available to all incoming teachers. I would like to express my appreciation to PVUSD and the Santa Cruz County Office of Ed for the new teacher project, Melissa and Marvelin, the induction process. I'm particularly grateful for the guidance and mentorship provided as well by Carrie Edelstein. 
Additionally, I extend my heartfelt appreciation to SALPA administration, Heather, Louise, and Leah for their unwavering support as I pursued my additional credential in special education. And I would also like to thank the PB High School Science team who is here present tonight. They're an awesome department to be able to work with, so collaborative, dedicated, and uplifting, so thank you guys. I also would like to thank um, Ed Services, especially um, Math and Science. So Mike Russo and Terry Redfern, they were integral in helping me develop my curriculum and helping me learn how to modify that for special education students. I also appreciated the training for talk moves and culturally responsive teaching. In conclusion, I express my sincere gratitude and the opportunity to be able to work with you here at PVUSD. Thank you. Um, is it on or no? It's on. Okay, sorry. Ah. Uh, I, I just want to note, um, I was notified by tech that it, it is on and it's recording for our YouTube channel. We just, we're not, they are able to hear it on the, our YouTube channel. We're just not able to hear it internally, but please do continue to use your mics for the YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, thank you. Um, saludos, greetings. Um, you know, first and foremost, uh, I think uh, regardless of our views and stance on subjects, you know, things that are affecting our community, I do want to uh, extend my condolences, uh, President Acosta, you know, for your loss. Um, hope the family as well, and, you know, um, and healing from it, right? Um, so I'm come here again to encourage you, the board, to uh, re-agendize the CRE contract. Um, there, community members, right, students have been coming week after week uh, requesting this, and uh, and they're being ignored. And I just I don't think that's correct. You know, there's a I think this is a people call it a democracy, right? And you know, uh, we should have differences, but uh, uh, we're allowed to have differences, right? But we're also allowed to have a, dis a discussion around it and actually hear, have a, a, a discourse, you know, a healthy dialogue around it, you know, and actually hear why is it that you don't want that, you know? Besides all the, the fluff and the stuff that is circulating, you know? So bring CRE back, the agenda to approve it. It's the last year. It's the only right thing to do. Um, the second thing I want to say is, uh, just real quick on the SRO issue, I just attended a um, a mid a mid year review budget for the city, and uh, Chief Zamora was uh, basically said that they cannot fulfill one of the positions, SRO positions, right? So that's actually impacting also the community, the Watsonville community at the city level, right? So I think we can do something different, right? I think enough time has passed, and the urgency and the the, the you know, I think we can do something different now. You know, support the students in a different way now. You know, uh, so those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, buenas noches. My name is Karina Moreno. Um, también my deepest condolences to you and your family for what you're going through. Um, and thank you for, for opening in that way. It was beautiful. Um, but I'm also here to support, and I'm not going to take up too much time because I want to support you know, the students and the teachers and the parents who've come out. Tamien, again, to ask you to include them in the conversation by agendizing the CRE program and having that conversation with them. I thank you guys for, I think, talking about it, but allowing, you know, um, and not violating the Brown Act and allowing them to be a part of the conversation, you know? And I don't think it's, it's a violation of the Brown Act either to acknowledge their emails, respond to them, let them know what's going on and, you know, agendize and, and allow us all to be a part of that conversation. You know, I know it's your responsibility to, to represent these people. And that means it is also your responsibility to look after their children and what it is that they're learning. And I'm asking you, you know, before you send them off into the world, let them have a chance to know where they come from, you know, and ground themselves in that way of like, who, who do I represent? Where do I come from? And why is that important? Um, but again, I'm not going to take too much time. When it's not just have a, have a good night. Thank you.
I had following three uh, Nancy Bilicic, Sergio Medina, and Austin Martin. Good evening, trustees. And um, I just, everything has already been said, and I already turned in a card. But I first would like to offer my personal condolences to you, Georgia. Um, tough situation. But I did want to thank and appreciate PVFT and the district working together for that event this weekend. It was truly amazing to see so many people working together to set it up and how long it took. And PVFT was right there working and so was administration, teachers, everybody together. And that collaboration was really nice to see. And then of course um, on the event, all the people that were so happy to get books. So thank you for sponsoring it and making it happen. That's it, thanks. Hello, my name is Sergio. Hello, have a, I hope you guys are having a good night. I am a student at Watsonville High School that uh, is a part of the Ethnic Studies program. And I wanna say there is a lot of community members, home board members talking for me, but this is a student talking to you. So I hope this opinion matters even a hundred times more than what they're saying. Um, I've been a part of the Ethnic Studies program now for three years. I've been for it since my sophomore year. I am currently a senior. And I just hope that this CRE contract that you guys are don't want to uh, renew does get renewed because I'm a student that needs it. the if the teachers aren't being supportive you think we're being supported um, with this contract and I just hope that you know I'm a senior I, this isn't going to be my problem but this is going to be the next generation's problem and I don't want that I have a little brother here who's a, a middle school student that if he's not getting the support with this renew the renewal of this contract um, you think I'm going to be okay with that and I won't be um, and that's it have you guys have a good night? Hello, I'm a senior at Walter High School. My name is Austin Martin. And I like to come here and talk about the CRE program, the Ethics Studies program, and bring it back. I've been taking Ethics Studies since my sophomore year. So as a student taking and learning this class, I'm confused on to why the students were not taken into consideration and the CRE program should come back. As a student, I've never seen an instance of bigotry or anti-Semitism in the classroom guided by the CRE program. All these ac accusations of anti-Semitism and bigotry are based off slander of Allison Tisnagel. I love this. Allison has wrote a letter to you explaining herself with evidence, and yet you still refuse to bring back the program based off prior claims. We are all a collective the same goal to bring education to the students about ethnic studies. A petition signed with over 17,000 signatures and 16 organizations in support to bring back the program with our own teachers have come to spoken here at the very board meetings and still no honor to their request. And now students like me have spoken in support of this program and still no discussion to bring back this program. It makes no sense to me after all this you can still refuse to bring back CRP program and bring support to our teachers. I finish my statement with asking you to please consider bringing back CRP program not only for the students but for the teachers. To quote my teacher Bobby Pels, the, uh, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it always bends towards justice. Thank you. All right, next three. Chris Webb, Bill Beecher, Nat Lowe. Um. My, my condolences to Trustee Acosta. If it wasn't for my mom, I would not be here right now this evening. Um, also, I want to thank Trustee Holm for actually reaching out and speaking to Allison. Uh, that's like real important to me because I value due process. I value due process when I opposed uh, the dismissal of Dr. Rodriguez in spite of whatever disagreements I had with her. I value due process when I've supported Renaissance and their student progress monitoring system. And, and the loss of that, I feel like, has hurt student due process and disciplinary matters. So that's, that's very important to me. Um, I also want to thank the community for taking the time to come and, and speak out and make um, PBSD as good as it can be. I feel like that's more helpful than to ignore issues and wait for them to come up in some formal complaint. 
So um, I hope that we can like actually hear things here, and that way people don't have to do these other things. Um, but in in their coming out, people have said they asked a good question. I um, and I can't help but think of it as we discuss this all the time. Like, who are we serving? There was two people came. I never recognized them. They they came and they had. What I, I got to go to their temple because whatever temple it is, they carry a lot of weight. I'll go there. Maybe I can finally get a feel for Renaissance and a couple other things. Um, but it's it's just like I, I don't get who who we're serving with some of this because I don't feel like that the student should be first in everything we do. Um, also, I want to thank PVFT and PVSD for working together to have a great event. I did really think it was great. Um, it was great to see elected officials there, including um, a current congressional candidate, Lawrence Milan, for Watsonville, District of Congressional District 18. It was good to see him and past board members, current board members, everyone on every level coming together. That was awesome. I hope we can continue to do that, and partly because there's great things at PVSD, and we didn't get a chance to show them all off. Thank you. Good evening. During the last board meeting on February 14th, approximately 17 teachers, parents, and students requested orally that an item be reinstated for the ethnicity program CRE, and it should be placed on a future agenda. There was no response from the board that those requests needed to be done in writing, and we're seeing that again tonight. It's within your purview to be able to tell these speakers they have to do it in writing. You haven't. I can only conclude one of two things. Either the board was unaware of the board policy that requests needed to be in writing, or the board knew but chose not to advise the requesters of that requirement so the board would not have to consider those requests. In either case, shame on the board. Shame for not knowing their own board bylaws, or shame for not informing those speakers. That should be considered a dereliction of duty. Consequently, I have amended my previous written request for an agenda item to amend the board bylaws to include notifying oral requesters that they need to provide a written request to the superintendent. And you have that, it's already gone to the agenda committee. I'm also presenting a written request to place on a future agenda the reinstatement of the ethnicity program, CRE. Since none of the people last time knew, I'm doing it for them. There's others that'll do it tonight. And while talking about the board bylaws that state the speakers to be given three minutes, for some time, the board has informed speakers they only have two. Either change the bylaws, which call for three, don't throttle your people that you serve. The bylaws provide for reducing the time if there are too many speakers. Follow your own bylaws or change them. It is recommended that the board be given training on their own bylaws, because as I look around, you don't seem to know them. Thank you. Good evening, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Chessman. Um, my name is Nat Lowe from Area 7. This is the fifth time I'm speaking here about the CRE contract, and at this point, I feel like I'm running out of things to say because the, the, you know, it's been five months and we've said it all. So I'm going to bring it back to why we are all here. We are here for our students. We've all received over 80 testimonies from students that Bobby Pelt sent you. For multiple meetings, students have come up here on a school night in front of an intimidating number of adults. Um, to speak their truth and to advocate for what is important to them, even when their voices are trembling. And I am so proud of all of them. Like every time a student comes out here to speak, it makes my heart sing. Through your words and your actions, and specifically how your actions do or don't align with your words, you are teaching our students how systems of power work in ways that directly impact them. You are teaching them how seven people in power, against the overwhelming desires of the students, teachers, parents, and the broader community, can deny them the ethnic studies education that they deserve based on false accusations from just two people. You are teaching them what it feels like to be disempowered by the system of public education. At the same time, we who have been showing up here month after month are collectively showing our students what it takes to challenge systems of power, to speak up, to organize, and to never give up. And in some ways, this is a practical education because ethnic studies, as you recall, was born because students organized, took to the streets, and challenge the people in power in their places of learning to get the education that they deserve. So I'm asking the board, what do you want to be teaching the students of PVUSD? And does that align with the words and actions that you have shown? How are you going to use the power that has been entrusted to you in this moment 
Our students and our community are speaking to you. Please listen. All right, next three. Martha Flores, Takashi Mizuno, Maximiliano Barasa. Trustee Acosta, I sentido pesame. I'm so sorry for your loss. I have talked before you about budget and accountability of EL learning, students learning. During an ELAC meeting in November, where the ELS was presenting, the site principal interjected, level three, flojos, no quieren estudiar, and other things. Lazy, they don't want to learn. This was not appropriate, but let me refresh your memory. During the fall, EL classes were reduced in size from 8 to 12 to 20 students, periods 1 through 5. No sooner said than done, classes were being held in the auditorium in larger rooms, where they were double up or triple up with other classes to cover absent teachers. This continues as of today. Hence, denying EL students their educational rights for ed code. Last time I spoke to you, I was telling you about how in the family our EL students were saying, oh yeah, the teachers learn Spanish faster than English. But now the family is having to address the bullying of one of our EL children. I hope that you will address this situation. Thank you for your time. Good evening. <coughs> First of all, Ms. Acosta and your family, Goshiu-san, goshiu so sama That means condolence in Japanese. Uh, last sun Saturday, I also attended or joined a uh, gathering to honor late Mas Hashimoto. He was one of the Japanese Americans whom I met when I started to come to uh, Wasande, that was about 18 years ago. And one of the first things which I learned from him was that Japanese were not welcome in, the Santa, in Santa Cruz City until Cabrillo College was built and UC Santa Cruz built. And I recently heard from one of Japanese Americans that one out of three students, high school students at Wasmir High School, were Japanese Americans in 1930. And even 1970, one out of ten students at Wasmir High School, they were Japanese Americans. Now, how many Japanese Americans are in high school in Wasmir? One of the main reasons was you can guess what happened to Japanese America, Japanese during World War II. All of the Japanese and Japanese Americans in Pajaro Valley, they were sent to Salinas first. They stayed there for three months, and then they were sent to Boston, Arizona. And uh, I also recently heard from one of uh, of the latest Japanese Americans, she is now 60, no, 1960 years old. She still lives in Masunde, at her <coughs> village. And I learned from her indirectly that her, her family came back to Masunde after they were released from the internment camp. And they, they were farmers and they grow uh, better. But nobody in Watsonville bought their letters. So the, their letters were, were bought by a guy from Los Angeles. That was, that was the situation just after World II in Watsonville. 
although there are some teachers in Watson during World War II, they helped the Japanese Americans. But after the World War, that's the situation of Japanese Americans who came back from the camp base. Thank you, Takashi. Time to expired. Me, okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you for that. Anyway, good time. Yeah. I usually go to bed between 8 and 9 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> so it's time for me to go home and go to bed. Anyway, thank you. Good evening, Board of Trustees. Uh, my representative is Trustee Flores, and I am from Area 5. And by the way, so glad you can make it today, Trustee Flores. I'm confused about why this issue is not back on the agenda yet. This is my third time speaking, and others like Mr. Pelt have been here over six times now. Why do you keep ignoring us? Why does my voice not matter to you? You should know that the more you avoid us, the more you motivate us to continue coming back. You have grown in numbers, and we will continue to do so. I've gotten my friends interested. I've gotten my teachers interested, who by the way, are also your constituents. They may not be here now, but trust me, they are watching and know who you are. And as a reminder to you, Trustee Flores, since you weren't here last meeting, I want you to know that the next time you're up for re-election, I'll be a voting age, and so all my friends. I ask you for the third time that you add this issue back to the agenda. Thank you. All right, next three, <clears throat> Lourdes Barasa, Gabriel Barasa, and Eli Davy. Davies or Davy? Davies. Uh, good evening, I'm Dr. Barasa, and I live in Area 5. I'm a constituent of Trustee Flores. Um, who thus far has done a poor job of representing her constituents, unfortunately. Why am I here a third time? Because the board continues to ignore us. People have come consistently. I really don't know what you need in order to listen to the people. Two people came, you guys jumped on it. More than 50 people, 15 people have come consistently and you ignore us. Why do those two people matter more than me? That's what I'd like to know. And who are you really serving? Are you serving those two people or the rest of the community? I, I really don't know what you guys need to hear to understand how important this issue is. And, and I just, you know, in, in the beginning, Trustee Acosta was talking about how she wants people to come and how do you encourage that if you keep ignoring us? That doesn't encourage involvement. That really discourages it. And so I am here to ask that you put CRE back for the third time and for some people here, maybe the eighth and ninth time. And I really hope that you're listening. I hope that you guys can work as a team to come together and put it back because everybody here keeps asking for you to do this. And I really do not understand why it's so hard to put it back. What do you need to hear from us in order for you to understand how important this is? So please put it back and stop ignoring us. Our voices matter too, not just those two people who came. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Gabriel Barraza. I live in Area 5. And I actually want to thank Mr. Beecher for pointing us in the right direction because I did submit a written request within the guidelines of the board within a week of this meeting. I submitted it to Mr. Sheckman. Thank you, Mr. Sheckman, for a very rapid response and forwarding that information to the board. So again, I ask what my wife asked. I ask what my son asked. Why do we continue being ignored? You know, Mr. Takashi had a very moving, very informational presentation about the treatment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Those things are not taught in school generally. These are not things that people in our community, which consists of Japanese people, Filipinos, 
Mexicans, Mexican Americans, people from uh, Slavic countries, all make up Watsonville. Each of us have a unique history. And those histories are not taught because people want to keep ethnic studies from being a core curricula. Now, the government, the state of California, has made it a requirement for people to be educated in ethnic studies. Now, ethnic studies goes against the dominant narratives in society. And a lot of people get scared because that challenges their power. You know, you guys are representing the constituents that live in this community. You guys need to take that into account. We are majority people of color in this community, and yet we have very little power, very little political power. But we will grow and we will remember your actions and your inaction. Thank you. Good evening, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Sheckman. My name is Eli. I use they, them pronouns. I live in Area 7. My nephew and niece both attend PBSD schools. I'm here to urge the Board to put the CRE contract on the agenda and vote to approve the contract. It struck me during the meeting two weeks ago how absurd it is that so many have spoken in support of CRE for nearly six months with zero change, and yet all it took to kill the contract renewal in September was two members of the public who provided no evidence or context to back up their accusations. It is worth asking who benefits from this and how, because it certainly is not the dozens of ethnic studies students who disagree with the actions and inaction of this board. It is absurd to me that this board can present horror at the accusations made, yet consistently refuse to accept invitations to visit ethnic studies classrooms, to talk to Allison, refuse the expertise of local ethnic studies professors who came here on their own time to educate them, um, and refuse to listen to their students and student trustee. I also want to give a huge respect to the students who come here to advocate for their education, for many of them, this may be their first time public speaking, and I applaud them for it, even if it should not be necessary for them to fight so hard with the adults that hold the reins of their education. Look to the advocacy that has inspired the students who have taken these classes. I ask the board to look at if they are serving the students or if they are serving themselves with rejecting this paid for beloved program. All right, last three, and then uh, just a little clarification. Judy Baker, are you up? Are you speaking under six? Because he wrote 10 on here, so I just want to clarify. Okay. So you might as well come up with the next group as well then. So, Excel Barasa, Providence, and Bobby Pelt. for the third time because you decided to ignore me once more. By ignoring us, you're discouraging me and other students who want to speak because we know our voices will be disregarded. Instead of listening to us, your constituents, you decided to listen to the two conservative people with false claims of anti-Semitism. Why is it that their voice matters so much more than ours? We, the students, are being robbed of a significant opportunity. Aren't you on the board to work for the students? and assure that we get the best possible education, there isn't an excuse for us to get such a watered-down version of ethnic studies. I have heard multiple people, including the people who have spoken at past board meetings, how much ethnic studies mean to them and how much it has improved their view of the world. By stopping progress, you're taking that away from us. I also want to remind Trustee Olivia Flores who is further disregarding our concerns that my brother and his friends will be old enough to vote by the time of the re-election. Please add this back to the agenda and actually represent your constituents. Thank you.
Uh, good evening, Bob Gerald, Watsonville High. I'm here once again to speak on the CRE contract. Uh, Vice President Soto, the night that this board decided not to renew the CRE contract, you made a, mo a motion to approve it. You said, and I quote, we have a viable program that's already been in place and I don't feel that we need to disrupt it because of an opinion. And yet, here we are. We are here mostly because of the opinions of President Acosta and Trustee De Serpa. Opinions they formed without speaking to Allison themselves. Opinions they formed without talking to the teachers that actually work with Allison. Opinions they formed without sitting in and on CIE PD session. Opinions they formed without observing an ethnic studies class in session. And opinions they formed without asking the students we serve what their experiences have been. That tells me that these opinions are just that, opinions. And they should not disrupt the progress of a viable program. And yet, here we are. In the meantime, folks have written and spoken up in support of Allison and CRE as a viable program. Myself and the ethnic study teachers of your own district have supported CRE as a viable program. Experts and professors from UCSC have supported CRE as a viable program. Over 1,700 people and 65 organizations have supported CRE as a viable program. Students who have taken ethnic studies and their parents have supported CRE as a viable program. When you have this many professionals and experts saying the same thing, it's not an opinion, it's a fact. CRE is a viable program. And yet, here we are. Vice President Soto, it's been six months since you said those words. This has gone on long enough. Right this wrong. Bring the CRE contact back. Thank you. Good evening, trustees and the entire community. My name is Providence, and I'm a parent of two amazing PBUSD students. But in the light of recent events, I think there should be a review of our existing protocols for hiring, training, and evaluating school principals. We need to work strong so that we take and we ensure that our, our children are being led by individuals who prioritize the safety and the well-being of them when they're in school. Regarding accountability within our district, we need to acknowledge the concerns raised about the leadership and oversight of our school principals. What happened at E.E. Hall and what's happening in all the schools with a lot of different principals is not okay. And there needs to be something done about it. A lot of kids are being affected by these principals who nobody holds accountable for their actions. I also support um, renewing the contract the CRE contract and I think with all the people that are here today everybody said everything already so I'm not going to repeat what everybody said but I think we should all learn to listen to each other and come to an agreement and like Soto mentioned earlier it's okay to disagree but it's also okay to talk about it and to come to a middle part an agreement and um Acosta, I'm sorry for the loss of your mother. Have a good evening. Um, I'm here from Watsonville Charter School of the Arts, and I went. I didn't personally go to the PV UFT. Uh, event this last weekend, but five of our parents did, and we gathered boxes of books for our mobile book library, which is set to uh, come out in May. So we're uh, hopefully teaming up with um, Live Like Coco's Foundation and getting a lot of support from them to create a library for the first time in our school on our school campus. We're a charter school, and um, today I'm just trying to. Get, uh, find out how to get more support from PBSD to uh, create a better play field for our kids, a track, um, all that is owned by PBSD. It's currently um, a location for the sewer, uh, the sewer system for the school, and it's not really something we can use, nor can we improve it because we don't have uh, permission to. So 
wanted to find out how we might be able to get support from PBSD to get funds um, and a plan because our parents are amazing fundraisers and uh, we've been doing it for a long time and like I said we went to uh, get lots of books for our mobile library so that we don't have to fundraise quite so much for uh, filling it. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Thank you all to all of our public speakers. Um, now we will be moving on to item seven, employee organization comments. Um, now is the time that we hear from our employee organizations. Each one will have five minutes and we will start with 7.1. Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers, PBFT. Do we have anyone here from PBFT to speak tonight? Good evening, um, good evening, trustees, Mr. Sheckman, um, condolences, President Acosta to you and your family. Um, I wanna start off by thanking everybody who helped with this massive event. Um, 40,000 books is no joke. Um, my back hurts, <laughs> so still. Um, but I just, I wanna say um, thank you to the, um, the coordinators and directors who sat down with us and you know, they asked me, they're like, what's your vision, <laughs> Nelly, you know, with, with all these books? I really wanna give a special thanks to Jen Bruno who was like, if you partner with us, you know, that would be like bigger. And she came through because our vision was Yes, we're bringing books to the community and what a wonderful thing to get books. People were walking out with hundreds of dollars worth of books for free and that's awesome. But this is also the opportunity for our district to really showcase all the amazing things that we do here because we have incredible programs. So with everyone's collaboration and we've had a really nice brainstorm um, meeting to, to plan um, it just was really cool to s actually see it come together last Saturday. Teachers who teach Baile Folklorico um, had their students perform. Uh, El Sistema came and had two of their student groups perform. Um, these are programs in our school district. Uh, we had, uh, you know, a teacher read, Mr. Sheckman read a book, um, and just to be able to see that alongside the literature, um, we had one of the maestras read a book on danza, um, and then we had our folklorico group dance. So it was really a, a, a very special event, um, and then the activities that were outside were just very cool. The physics bus was awesome. I wish I had more time to spend some, you know, to spend in there. Um, and a hu so big thank you to our membership and CSEA because Watsonville High School, they really showed up. Um, their people were there to clean, to help us set up, do a lot of heavy lifting. So thank you to Joe Gregorio and his staff. Um, but the Watsonville High School student volunteers were just incredibly impressive. Um, some of those students were there Wednesday night Friday night late where I was like, you need to make sure, I wanna make sure you're getting into, <laughs> into your parents' car <laughs> so that you get home safe because we were there late and they were back early in the morning on Saturday to continue volunteering. So it was just really wonderful to um, not only help create this opportunity, this day, but to see our students um, enjoy having that sense of purpose and giving um, to the community. So that was really awesome. Um, so yeah, anyways, I was you know, still kind of writing on that. Um, and I really do hope that it's something that we can do again. Not 40,000 books big, but <laughs> it is something that I want us um, to be able to do. Uh, first book, that is an organization that the American Federation of Teachers, that's our union. Um, and uh, they focus on providing um, uh, low cost, well, reduced prices on amazing books. You saw some of the titles. Um, and so our district being a Title I district, we qualify for purchasing books through First Book at a discounted rate. 
So um, that is also something that our teachers, if they sign up through First Book, they can um, qualify to buy books that would normally be 20 some dollars for you know around 10, uh, even under $10. Um, all right, so I want to speak on ethnic studies as well because we are, the American Federation of Teachers, it's, we're based on social justice. This is something that you've heard me speak about for many years now. But ethnic studies, it can promote empathy, that social justice, and academic success. I'm, uh, you know, I'm a Latina, I'm a woman of color in this society, and I stand in a space that it wasn't until recently that you got to, that we see more women and women of color in leadership positions and a lot of times were questions but growing up in the 70s and 80s going through school i didn't see me in the content i didn't know that those were that was my space i thought where do i see a majority of the people of color doing the hard labor um so what ethnic studies does is it blows the dust off of archived historical contributions of the marginalized groups in our society. And this program, it helps students see themselves and each other as part of this narrative that we live here in the United States. And as I mentioned last time, I know that with the CRE contract, it would be to help the administrators be trained that's important. Again, our administrators are there to support us, the teachers and the staff. They're there to be the first line of um, communication for the parents when a parent has a, a question. And they need to be trained. They need to understand the importance of this curriculum. It is something that we, is, you know, it's part of our state requirement. Why not be fully trained on it? So we hope that you take that into consideration as you go back in to the next um, agenda setting committee and put that back on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. We also look forward to working with the trustees to organize a meeting with the new superintendent. Thanks. On next is 7.2 California School Employees Association. Do we have anyone here from CSCA? Seeing none, we'll move to 7.3 for Haro Valley Association of Managers, Kavam. Do we have anyone here to speak on behalf of Kavam? Good evening, board members. And good evening, Superintendent and Penny Stephen Chapman. And also my condolences, Mr. Preston. Yes. So my name is Katie Christmas, and I am the proud principal of the Pajaro Panthers and the Lakeview Eagles. And so I'm here this evening just to share a little bit about the work that I've had the honor and privilege to do this year, being the principal of two schools in a unique situation with um, a tremendous amount of trauma. And so I've just put together a little flyer here with a few bullet points about some of the things that have gone well. So I'll start over here. Uh, some of the opportunities that this unique situation has brought to us. So some of the glows uh, for our campus this year are what is going well in our leadership capacity and through the support of district leadership and our directors. Uh, we're really starting to integrate our positive behavior intervention systems along with our restorative practices to support our students in self-regulating their emotions um, and that's with the support of our district office student services department. Thank you, Dr. Alcaraz and also Ms. McLean. Well, I'd also like to acknowledge that through the collaboration with other district leaders, we've increased the types of award achievement opportunities for our students. So when you see pictured in this document is actually a pancake breakfast that we offered for our students who showed growth in MAP uh, scores, both in achievement and growth. And so we had about 150 students who were invited between the two campuses. So there's still opportunities to grow uh, for both schools, but we also had family members offer to support us with that pancake breakfast. 
ADA has increased despite uh, Pajaro being transported into Lakeview. We have actually seen an increase in both school sites, so that's been a success for us, but we do know that we still need to focus on increasing our average daily attendance. And then what I appreciate most, and I wish we had more time to do, though I do know the importance of opening Pajaro, is we've been able to share best practices across site, both instructionally, social-emotionally, and also um, with regards to behavior management systems. So when I think about opportunities moving forward for the remainder of this year, I really want to leverage the time to highlight the importance of our assessments. So we've been looking at NWA MAP, but our next step is to focus in on the CASP, which is the state test, and really try to make sure that our families, our students, and our staff understand the importance of that with regards to measuring our ability to meet the state standards. I'd also want to refine our behavior management system, so we're still refining those despite seeing improvements and opportunities that students are taking to seek out adults, trusted adults, including counselors and administration, to report unsafe situations. And so if I could advocate for anything moving forward on behalf of leadership is to continue to be supported by our district office uh, leaders in our capacity to support our teachers, our classified staff, our students, and our families. And just to highlight how those are currently taking place, thank you, Michael Berman, for bringing in the Family Engagement Institute to leaders. Um, that's giving me opportunities to collaborate with folks nationwide to integrate uh, opportunities for our families, our staff, and our students. And then I'd also like to uh, highlight a need to focus on staff retention. And certainly, transportation has been impacted that does impact our, our ability to make sure that our students are getting to campus um, on time, ready to learn, and then we are making up for that loss of learning and trying to do so within the year. So I wanna just thank you all, honestly, for giving me the time and space to share what's going well um, on our campus, and I hope to come back to you all and share some of what has changed in preparation for the next school year. So thanks very much, and I hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Moving on to item 7.4, Communication Workers of America, CWA. This is our substitute teachers. Do we have anybody here to speak on behalf? Seeing none, we will move on to eight, our action items. Um, action item 8.1, resolution number 232425, Women Histories Month. This report will be presented by our superintendent, Murray Shackman. Thank you, President Acosta. Thanks for hanging in there, everyone who's still here. This is an important topic. We move from Black History Month to Women's History Month, but rather than, we have the resolution up there, but I'd like to highlight two women, a little bit obscure, at least the very first one. So the first group I presented this to, somebody got on the computer really quick and was able to answer who that was. So do you know who Mary Ware Dennett was? All right, excellent. She was an artist, a suffragist, birth control reformer, and an anti-war advocate. She, been her, she began her reform career at the National American Women's Suffrage Association, where she served as a literature coordinator and wrote a number of influential essays for the movement. In 1915, she founded the first birth control organization in the U.S., the National Birth Control League, later named the Voluntary Parenthood League. I just thought it was appropriate to highlight somebody we probably don't know about, and certainly in 1915, in what some themes are relevant today, she was the head of the game. The other famous American woman in history is very contemporary in her achievements. Presently, she is earning a 4.4 GPA in her schooling. Her leadership has positively impacted the school culture and the people around her. She's a leader and a top student in her school and is already serving on an important and influential board of trustees. She will be more impacting after she attends Brown University. So Ruby Romero Maya and Mary Ware Denon are our women in history for our presentation tonight. Thank you. Do we have any uh, public speakers to this item? Uh, we do not. Okay, seeing none. 
I'll bring it back to the board for a discussion. Any discussion on the board? Yeah, take you back to home. Thank you, Superintendent Shackman. I just wanted to thank you for you know, highlighting Famous women. Famous women, you know, and uh, I just think of that that quote: um, "Well-behaved women seldom make history." And um, well, you know, she's making history. And um, thank you. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion. Thank I'll you, second. Dr. Hall. Thank you, Trustee Jessica. Any other discussion or comments from the board? Yes, Trustee Valeno Scow. Any other discussion or comments from the board? Our student trustee would like to make a comment. Um, thank you, Interim Superintendent, Mr. Jackman, for this mm -hmm. resolution and the honor. Um, I'd also like to mention or thank many of my sheroes that are also my teachers that have greatly impacted my education. And I can't thank them enough for their support in everything. So, okay. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, wonderful. I have a first and a second, so I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? The motion carries 7-0. <clears throat> Moving on to action item 8.2, revised cost description for the district receptions. This report will be presented by Pam Shanks, Director of Human Resources. Good evening. So if the light is on, that means it's on? Okay, thank you. If okay, perfect. Okay, so good evening, President Acosta, board members, and Superintendent Checkman. Uh, my name is Pam Shanks, Director of Classified Personnel. Um, the item brought before you tonight is a revised class description for district receptionist. Um, a presentation of the new district office lobby project was presented to the board in October after it opened in August of 2023. As with any new project, there were logistics that needed to be ironed out. Um, we found a couple things. One, that keeping the position and purchasing wasn't really working. Um, since a good number of the visitors that come to the district office are here for human resources primarily, student services, migrant seasonal head start, and various other departments. So when we looked at also at other uh, districts and county offices, we found that a district receptionist that was structured the way we were typically did report to the human resources office. Um, the primary duties of this position were written initially for the planning of the building to have a main lobby for visitors. So there was a couple of changes needed in the class description. One is removing the director of purchasing as the supervisor <clears throat> and instead changing it to an assigned administrator. Um, the position will report to HR um, and there's three different administrators in HR so she works with all three of us. Um, the removal of receiving, sorting, and distributing of incoming and outgoing mail, that's also been a very difficult task for that position to complete, so we've moved it to a different position, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> the, so the revised class description um, was shared with CSEA um, and the incumbent in the position as well. Um, any questions regarding the job duties will continue to be discussed with the current uh, incumbent as needed over time. Um, the revised class description was taken to the Personnel Commission on February 15th and approved. Um, the pay range will remain the same since there were not substantive um, changes to the job description. Um, so this evening I asked the board to approve the revised class description as presented. Thank you, Ms. Shanks. Do we have any public speakers to this item? No speakers. Okay, I'll bring it back to the board for discussion. I'll make a motion to approve. I have a motion to approve from uh, Trustee DeSerpa. Is there any other discussion or a second? I'll second. Okay. And is there any other discussion from the board? No, it's the same title. Mm -hmm. That's a different position I'll talk about next. Yeah. 
Any other questions or comments from the board? Um, I, I, no, I, um, I do have admissions. I have a question. You said that, and, and I understand the structure of the three administrators. I'm taking that means you as classified, the director as certificated, and then the assistant suit of HR. So the three administrators you're referring yes. to, this person reports to. Yes. Um, I, I just know from a business perspective, when an employee has more than one direct report, things get very confusing. It gets very confusing for the employee. It can get confusing for the admin. It, it could get confusing for someone that's in the replacement on a sub basis. It can get confusing for just other employees in general. So I'm that's very obscure to me that you're saying this person has a direct report to three different people? Is that what I'm hearing you say or am I mishearing you? So what I would say is the position, Brian, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but the position would report to the assistant superintendent, but then for logistical things like covering, scheduling, things like that, if she is taking vacation, things like that, um, one of the three of us might cover that piece of it. So she just, um, and one of us will be a supervisor over her and supervise or uh, and evaluate her, but um, depending on what the issue is and the logistic the logistical piece of it, we all may cover that piece of it. It sounds like Mr. Sackman. I was gonna say, like, so, the assistant soup will assign one of the two directors to be her direct report so she won't have to report to all three of us and that way that person can manage her schedule because she's you know if she takes vacation we have to find coverage etc so it won't be that three different people are coming at her to you do this you do that so it would either be one of the two directors who would be the direct report and working with her and doing her evaluation and all of those types of things and that's kind of where i was going with that so i, I appreciate your elaboration but also so it's also in, inclusive of for time off mm -hmm. for evaluation purposes and correct there will be one specific direct report i mean and obviously if Th let's just say that was Ms. Shanks in her role, and she's on vacation, then it might have to roll to somebody in the absence of she was right. like on a two-week vacation or something or some other sort of leave, right? Correct. But yeah. I just want to make sure that there's clarity there because that, right when I heard that, that was just a lot of ambiguity for me. And, and just from a business perspective, I'm just saying that just doesn't work in the real world. Yeah, and we don't want her reporting to three different people. We all know that can be very confusing. So. It was me that she was reporting to. I was working with her on all her stuff, and since I've moved, I'm still kind of doing that, but eventually it'll probably be Susan or, or, um, because Susan's in the, Susan Perez is the interim director of HR. Okay. But right now I'm handling it since, for the continuity's sake. But then eventually when we have permanent people, it will most likely be the, the certificated the person. Okay, that, that's yeah. the one thing that was my hesitancy on it. Thank you for the clarification from both of you. Okay. So I have a first and I have a second. Is there any other discussion or thoughts or comments that come up from anyone else? See none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries seven times. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, are you staying with I'm us? back up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. Um, okay, <laughs> item 8.3. New class description, purchasing and warehouse assistance. This report will be presented by none other than our Ms. Pam Shanks, the Director of Human Resources. Great, thank you again, President Acosta, board members, and Superintendent Checkman. Um, this item brought before you tonight is a new class description titled Purchasing and Warehouse Assistant. Um, I worked with uh, Rich Ariano, the Director of Purchasing, um, on a variety of different duties um, that he was needing. And there was a need to have a position in that department that encompasses a variety of job duties. Um, some of the duties will be shifted from the district receptionist, as we talked about earlier, um, and other duties are being established to support the work of the purchasing function, such as um, assisting with various purchasing duties, uh, driving delivery duties, uh, receiving and handling incoming and outgoing mail, which is being moved from the district receptionist to this position, uh, reviewing orders, purchase requisitions, etc. Um, the Personnel Commission was presented this also on uh, sorry, fe February 15th um, and w placed it on range 37 of the classified salary schedule. Um, and so I just asked the board tonight to approve this new class description um, and also the attached classified salary schedule is presented. Thank you, Mr. Do we have any public speakers on this item? 
No, we do not. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for discussion. I'll make a motion to approve. I have a first. Do I have a second or any other comments? I, I just have a quick question, Pam. The CSEA signed off on this as well, right? They're all yes, we did share it with CSEA as with well. It. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll second. <laughs> so I have a first and second. Do I have any other comments for discussion from the board? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Ms. Shanks, for your time this evening. Um, moving on to item 8.4, approved memorandum of understanding between PBFT and PBUSD for the 2023 2024 summer school pay rates. This report will be presented by our interim assistant superintendent of human resources, Brian Saxon. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening, President Acosta. My condolences on your loss. And uh, good evening, Vice President Soto, Board of Trustees, and Interim Superintendent, Mr. Sheckman. I got it right this time. So uh, PVFT and PVUSD is pleased to uh, present this summer school MOU for our summer school rates. Um, it's exactly the same as last year. We're gonna be paying our teachers their hourly per diem for working in our um, expanded learning, migrant, or extended school year extended school year is our special education summer school the teachers will also have the opportunity to work um, additional hours to offer that nine hour day at seventy dollars per hour however if you do choose to work those you must commit to work the hours during the day of summer school and commit to working the three weeks of summer school so uh, we respectfully request your approval of this mou Thank you, Mr. Saxon. Do we have any public speakers on this? No, item? we do not. All right, seeing that, I'll bring it back to the board for discussion. Any discussion from the board? I'll make a motion. I have a motion from uh, Trustee Dr. Holm. A second. I have a second from Trustee DeSerper. Is there any other questions or comments from the board? I do have just a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the rate for the teachers, and I know we also have so we have preschool teachers, et cetera, doing work during the summer? We have preschool classes, but they're, they have their own summer programs already going. Do they get, they don't get any No, this is, this is separate for them, yeah. Okay. Any other questions from anyone else? I, I, I do have a question that came up when you mentioned that this is the same rate as last year. Mm -hmm. um, it's, not, it's the same structure. The, the seventy dollars is the same rate. Obviously, the rates have gone up because our salaries went up. But yeah. that, that was my question. Yes. Did it reflect that? Because I think we maybe had settled negotiations before the start of that summer, correct? Correct. So this is based off our most current salary schedule it for does their per diem. That, yes. that that pay increase. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That that was my question. Yeah. I knew where I was going. So I have a first and second. Do I have any other discussion from the board? Comments. Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you, Mr. Thank Sanders. you very much. Okay, and now we are moving on to. We have 8.5, I guess. 8.5. Um, the Creative Curriculum Transitional, transitional sorry. Um, Kindergarten. This report will be presented by our very own Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Education, Claudia Mitchell. Thank you. Good Welcome. evening, President Acosta and uh, Board of Trustees. So, what I'm doing is I'm bringing tonight the. Uh, it's called the Creative Curriculum. It's a proposed uh, new curriculum for our transitional kinder classes. And the reason that we're bringing this forward is because there are preschool learning foundations available on the CDE website. However, those are going to be updated this summer and then a release. They've already started to share some of what the updates will be. And so we want to make sure that we're choosing a developmentally appropriate curriculum for our transitional kinders that align with the new updates that are going to be out by the um, CDE. The title of that new document is going to be the California Preschool Transitional Kindergarten Learning Foundations, or the PTKFL. And some of the main reasons for their uh, revisions was around looking at um, not just a new title, but there's new domains in there, um, the structure of language and literacy and how that's expected to be taught, new age labels, increased alignment to kindergarten, common core, 
Um, there's added teacher support sections in there, and then also an emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so when we're looking at that new domain that's in there, it's mostly focused on the approaches to learning. Um, and you'll see on the left side of the screen where it's addressing actually the um, curiosity, interest, and initiative, engagement, perseverance, working memory, inhibitory control, flexibility, problem solving, planning, and collaborating with others. Those are skills that we're seeing some of our kinders struggling with because we haven't um, really carved out that time appropriately for our TKs to build those skills prior to going into kindergarten. So with this new curriculum, it does actually allow us for more structured um, teaching around these skills that our TKs need before going to kinder. It also aligns with the assessment, the desired results developmental profile, and also the Head Start Early Outcomes framework. So the goal with this is everything's going to be aligned. Um, so with this curriculum, it would be used beginning in the fall in all of our TK classrooms. Um, it is available in English and in Spanish. It uh, meets the UPK curriculum checklist, and it has a lot of hands-on learning activities for our students, a lot of project-based learning for them. Um, we would be able to provide uh, teacher training for them with the company as well. And then it would also offer alignment for all of our programs, zero to five years old, because we do actually have our preschools and even our home preschools are using this curriculum. So this would just be the TK version of that same piece. Just to give you an idea of uh, what's included in it, there are actually three components to it. There's the content, context, and instructional strategies. And you can see on the tree on the left-hand side there, um, the different areas that are included across those three components. Give me a second to take a look at those. And then just across the school year, these would be the units that students would be able to experience. The very first one is um, about six weeks long. It's about really building that classroom community. And then the very last one is a getting ready for kindergarten. It's also about six weeks long. The other units are roughly about four weeks. They are interchangeable in order, so teachers would have the ability to rearrange that order based on um, what they would want to do for uh, alignment for their students and things like that, maybe th to align with activities at the site. But we would have to have the community building one and then the getting ready for kinder they would definitely have to stay at the beginning and the end so um, another big reason why we want to do this shift is because it, using this curriculum is also going to allow us to really focus in on that much needed social emotional learning piece for our students um, at the tk level so we would be able to address things like identity emotional intelligence modeling emotion regulation and co-regulation solve so problem solving or social problem solving skills and then learning about what empathy and caring are because we know four-year-olds need some help with that um, so what we're doing is we're asking for approval to adopt the creative curriculum as our core material for TK beginning in fall of 24 2024 Thank you. Um, do we have any public speakers to this item yes we do we have one Judith Baker again. So my daughter is at Starlight at the TK there. And I volunteer every Thursday. Even if I have one sick, I make sure I get it covered. So I'm there every Thursday and I'm in the classroom. And um, from my understanding, TK is still pretty new. Like the first, the first, um, TK students still haven't graduated high school, so like, we're all still like really learning what this is. Um, TK for me is very much preschool, and um, I think our I know our teacher, even with me there, like she needs way more support in um, in the classroom to be able to teach the curriculum. That's awesome. I have no objections to uh, to teach the curriculum that's there, and also the while the support staff is there to focus in on those social emotional needs of the students. Um, I think for uh, my daughter, you know, more importantly than, and she's doing amazing, um, she came from a strong uh, preschool background, uh, two years at uh, 
the um, Watsonville uh, Adult Ed, so it's the Watsonville uh, Cooperative Preschool. Um, and uh, I think more importantly for, for her and for the other kids, uh, not so much learning like you're memorizing ABCs, but it's really learning how to flex disappointment muscles in the classroom and, and you know, everywhere. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Tiger. Um, and that was our last topic. Okay. Um, I will bring it back to the board now for discussion and comments from the board. Any questions or comments from the board? Yes, Trustee Bolano Scow. I'm sorry, say the first part. Uh, Trusty Polanska, I know it does you can't hear it, but if you could still turn on your mic. <laughs> oh, I, I just want to make well, sure our YouTube I'm, channel is hearing yeah, you on repeat. That's okay. <laughs> In this proposed one, yes. So they are still actually addressing language arts, they're addressing math, science, social studies topics. They are still addressing all of those pieces, but most of it's done through project, project base. The other um, piece to add to this whole thing is we are gonna be doing a restructure of what TK looks like across the school year. Um, currently, it basically looks like a kinder light classroom, um, which isn't necessarily appropriate to their developmental age. So the switch along with this curriculum would be that the first half of the year, if you were to walk into the room, it would look a lot more like a preschool classroom physically than it would a traditional kinder class. Um, that's not saying that there isn't any learning going on, um, but the emphasis, the primary emphasis at the beginning is still getting um, the social emotional piece and building community, building relationships. What does it mean to be in one of the, in a classroom at this age? Um, once they come back from winter break, then the classroom looks more like a kinder classroom. So when we're talking about teaching whole group, small group, independent time, partner time, all of those things are really being established in that first semester so that when we do make that that flip and there's still social emotional going on in the second semester but now we're shifting more towards the academic piece um, as they transition out we've got those skills built in and then we just layer on top of those for the rest of the year before they go to yeah. Thank you. Any other? So, uh, I'm sorry, just did you say that you have a comment? I was going to make a motion to approve. Thank you so much. Um, have a motion. Any other questions or comments? Can I have a second? Okay, let's see. Now, um, my, my question was, so just in regards to also the input the public comment, are we having enough support system there for these So that, that, that is one of the things that we're aligning right now. Um, with there's uh, usually IA support in all of our classrooms. Sometimes there might be an IA that's out, and so the site has to readjust and provide coverage. But for the coming year, for sure, we're going to be having more support in our TK classrooms than we are this year. So there's a ratio of adult to student, and um, it, once we hit that ratio, we have to have two people in the room for the whole time that the, the students are in the room. And Two, two points. So one, what is the ratio for adult to student? Currently it's one to 12. Um, one to 12. And I think Lisa, you were saying one to 10 starting in the fall. So it's currently one to 12, but we're going to reduce it to one to 12. I'm, I'm sorry, I thought I heard one to 12 and one to 10. Yeah, I'm so sorry. It, yes. So we were working off of, yeah, we were working off of one to 12 at one point, but we are making that shift to go one to 10. So it will be one to 10. So if, if a classroom has. So um, it's like it's one to 12 on paper, but in actuality it's one to 10. And Is well, that how I should yes. understand that? Yes. And, but the number of time, the amount of minutes that we have the second person in the room is actually going to increase for next year. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really a little confused. So it's, it's one to 10. 
So, but currently it's not necessarily for the full time. So next year they will have a second person full time in the room. And what's, that was gonna be my second question. What is the time span? It's the whole time. Like, Anytime I mean, that there's more like than 10. Is it a hour day? Is it a six hour? It many? depends on the site. So next year we have four more sites going full day. So this coming year we will only have two TK sites that are not full day and that is Bradley and Starlight. And those are what, like four hours, five? Yeah, they're about, yeah, about four hours, not more than kind that. Kind of like what most of us would think back to the traditional yeah. kindergarten model, right? Yeah. And then the full day model is? It's a full regular day like kinder and first grade and all those other ones. So it's like kids are usually in school about six hours. And so you're saying the one to ten is right now for a portion of that time, but you're looking to... We're expanding it for the full time. What do you time. mean by a portion of that time? So if it's like a six-hour program, the portion is for... Okay, after two hours, we have to get a second person. That, I mean, so the, the full day, the current full day sites actually have somebody there the whole time. The, the ones that are not, so the six that are, are currently not full day, don't have the person there longer than I think it's a 3.75. It's a, it's a lower amount. So now that they're expanding out to the full day, they'll have the person in there. As long as there's over 10 students in the room, then they have a second person in the room with them, with them that entire time. And is this a volunteer as an parent? No, it's or a paid instructional assistant. It's a paid instructional assistant. Mm -hmm. So we will for sure have that support if it's over, again, how many hours? Once it reaches over? So the full day kinder is at the six hours like the rest of the school would be. And, and once it reaches how many hours, they have to have someone full time? It's not about number, it's the, um, it's the number of students, so over 10. So if they, right, so if they have 10, so even if it's, if it's 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., let's just say, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at 8 a.m. if it's 12 students, they have the full-time instructional assistant throughout the whole day, is that what you're saying? Yeah, there'd be like maybe a 15-minute difference to allow for like recess or something like that, but yeah. Okay, okay, I, that's something. Really yeah. for me. I'm sorry for all the questions. That's okay, I'm just, I'm that's why I'm here. Issue and I, and I can, <laughs> not you. Anyone else? I have a first and a second. Anyone else have any questions, comments, anything? I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Thank you, Ms. Manhattan. Is it Perry Thank you. Zero? Um, and then our next item <coughs> is 8.6 eight Comprehensive School Safety Plan. This report will be presented by our own Dr. Ivan Alcaraz, Director of Student Services. Thank you. Good evening, President Acosta, Board of Trustees, and Interim Superintendent Marie Sheckman. I'm Dr. Ivan Alcaraz, the Director of Student Services, and yes, today we'll be talking about our school comprehensive safety plans. This is kind of an annual uh, presentation to the board as an action item. So I'm going to go through a little bit of just a timeline as to where it, it begins and uh, up to now. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the different parts of each of part one and part two of the comprehensive safety plan. So I know that the date there for California Education Code um, says that we should have this uh, plan approved by March 1st, but it does uh, generally begin the process in September. So normally at the beginning of the school year, we meet with our school administrators to begin the process of identifying uh, sites, uh, team members who are going to be contributing and looking at the comprehensive school safety plan and all of the p components associated with the plan. And so throughout the year, they're meeting with these team members to look at their school plans and to make adjustments and alterations as needed. Um, beginning in the month of January, uh, Student Services Department does offer office hours to site administration uh, and the teams to be able to consult, to be able to review the plans with them, and then offer any uh, suggestions or alterations that may be needed to the school plan. In some cases, uh, some of us, including myself, have gone out to the sites to do some walkthroughs with the, with the administration and the teams to review their, their plans with them. And then we come together in the month of February at the beginning with law enforcement to look at 
these plants as well. So we typically work with our Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office um, to look at the um, Santa Cruz County area, uh, comprehensive safety plants, uh, Watsonville Police Department. And then for the Monterey County areas, we do work with the Fire Department uh, Chief Mendoza from Monterey County as well. And so with that being said, we come to uh, this board meeting to present to you uh, the comprehensive safety plans. Um, you'll notice that there are two uh, parts to the comprehensive sa uh, safety plan. Part one uh, really focuses on site and district policies as well as culture and climate uh, indicators. So you'll notice on part one, we look at there's uh, suspension and expulsion data uh, that the site is reporting. They may be utilizing uh, some of the other indicators like our California Health to Kids surveys. Maybe they're pulling data from our U2 survey data to um, provide some context in terms of their culture and climate as well. In part one, you will also notice that there is the, um, their drills and when they're scheduled to have their drills or fire drill, evacuation drills for earthquake, uh, shelter in place, as well as some of the other ones that we do normally were like ALICE and threat assessments as well. Um, in addition, there are a couple of other things in there like dress code, for example, is part of that part one. Um, as well as some of the bullying prevention uh, uh, policies and procedures, some of the PBIS initiatives, some of the restorative practices that they're um, embarking at the school site. So all of that lives in part one. Uh, part one is a public document um, upon approval from uh, the school board. Um, all sites will be posting that to their front page so that uh, folks in the community can also continue to review that. Um, I know we do have some approval, but this is an ongoing kind of live document as staff changes and things change in, in, in our system, we might have to go back and make those adjustments, but there is that timeline where the board has to approve it by March 1st. Um, upon approval, we do send all of our uh, comprehensive school safety plans to um, County Office of Education, so we work with our partners at COE to also um, review those plans as well. Uh, part two is actually a confidential component because it does uh, focus on our emergency plans, our evacuation maps, it has our roles and responsibilities, the staff that support in critical incidents, for example. So that is a actual um, non-public document so that does not get posted and it's, it's an internal document for review and uh, feedback for the sites. So that one will not get posted, but it does include a lot of our response and in emergency plans. So posting that would actually jeopardize us if we uh, did something like that. With that, um, I kindly request that the board approves our comprehensive school safety plan. Do we have any public speakers in the We do not. All right, seeing that, I will bring it back to the board for discussion, questions, and comments. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ivan Ankaras, for putting this together. I know um, safety and security is, is a big concern, I know, especially in my area. And I also just like to, to thank uh, the SRO officer, uh, CJ Johnson at Watsonville High. I know he cares a lot for Watsonville High, and uh, as well as uh, Midway and Radcliffe. He tries his best to, you know, do pass bys along the schools. Uh, he's the eyes and ears for the safety and security of Watsonville High School. And he's quick to take the lead, you know, sometimes when there's a, a perceived threat at Watsonville High. I've seen him personally um, take the lead, um, making sure all the exits at Watsonville High are secure. He, he's quick to call, you know, Watsonville PD to let them know what this, um, the threat could be, possibly. And... Another thing people sometimes don't seem to understand, yes, he's the SRO officer at Watson High School, but I've seen people talk to him directly about how they feel. Um, I've seen him work closely with the mental health clinician, and he's just, you know, he's there for, you know, the students. Um, they're really happy to talk to him. They, they trust him. And I just want to say uh, thank you, CJ John, and thank you and everybody who put this report together. Thank you, Trustee Dodge Jr. Trustee Bolano Scow. Yeah, so we're always in ongoing conversations with our partners, right, with Wanfield Police Department. Um, so we actually have a meeting tomorrow with Captain um, to further discuss uh, plans on how to find coverage and potentially 
find alternative plans for that SRO and, and mental clinician. But at this current moment in time, staffing seems to continue to be an issue as well for our partners at Watsonville Police Department, and they have not been able to fill that position. So we're um, going to be engaging tomorrow in a dialogue about potential you know, other options that may be available to us at this moment in time. Trustee Sheckman, uh, Trustee Sheckman, <laughs> Superintendent Sheckman, I'll get it together tonight, I'm sorry. Well, it's okay. Uh, over the course of this year, Officer Samora and I have had discussions, and he's felt a little pressure. And what Dr. Alcaraz is saying is the sad the truth that there are at least six now short. We looked at other alternatives and really haven't found anything or anybody to step to the plate. There was discussion of that, and we're very open to it. I don't personally believe, and I've talked to the principal about it, we, we, uh, and Brian will grimace, they're all males on that campus, and we've got to bring a female over, and we can't advertise for a female. We can't advertise and hope. No, I don't think so. Yeah, we, we've been exploring different options and have not been successful. Yeah, so I, I will add to um, the PV High component. We also have been working with our, our, our probation department as well, so we do have a student success program as well. A partnership between a case manager and a probation officer to provide some level of support and you know address some of the needs there um, in terms of the in-house suspension uh, typically that's an administrator uh, who takes the lead on uh, supervising uh, generally speaking in the office um, they collect work, work from the classroom they're out of the classroom but in the school setting to continue learning um, inside the office Yeah, generally speaking, yes. There are some times where they may seek the support from another staff member on campus if they need to step out for whatever reason. Uh, but generally speaking, it's the administrator who takes the lead on that supervision for that student. Yeah, we, we do encourage um, in-house suspension as one of the alternatives to out-of-school suspension. Um, however, you've noted that there are some times where that's not possible, um, and it also really highly depends on the incident, right? So there are some times where suspension is needed to create that distance and separation in that moment of reflection. And that moment of reflection sometimes cannot happen inside the office and may have to happen outside of that. So whenever possible, our sites do explore the option of in-house suspension. Um, we do. So um, I regularly meet with our assistant principals or administrators who um, oversee discipline at their campuses. So we generally cover these areas in terms of what uh, is the response and communication that should go out during a suspension. Typically, um, it, during a suspension, there is a notification or email that gets sent to the, uh, the student's teachers indicating um, the suspension and the ed code violation that was that cost or that led to that suspension and the number of days uh, or suspension with the return date as well. Um, there's also within our student information system, there is a printout form for a suspension form that typically gets printed out. And part of that conferencing with the uh, guardian, there is a conversation in the notice of suspension that is issued at that time to the guardians.
So I, I would, if you're um, normally a teacher, maybe um, preoccupied with uh, with the class and teaching the class. What um, some staff members uh, do is they do uh, request a student to step out of the classroom for some time for just um, to be able to get the class going, and then they may be able to have that dialogue and conversation with the student. Other staff members may not be able to do that at that moment in time, may refer the student to the office for an office referral, and then follow up with that phone call or phone conversation at the end of the day or at the end of the period when possible. We actually encourage st uh, the staff, if there's an issue in the classroom, to work with the family to be able to you know, create a positive conversation out of that incident. imagine any other philosophy other than to encourage teachers to contact even with a small problem. They can't always because as Yvonne has indicated, you know, we have 30 plus kids and we teach. I, I do want to add a little history. Uh, before Dr. Alcaraz was in this position, there were schools that did have teachers doing suspension centers. The one at Watsonville High was a lose, lose proposition and the superintendent at that time made sure it closed. Um, we had a program that I thought was pretty successful right when I it was still in place when I left in 2015. We had a teacher who was trained in a program, the seven, Challenge. thank you so much, I knew you'd know. And um, <laughs> if a kid was caught smoking pot or in possession of a small um, amount of marijuana, the family could agree to waive the suspension and participate in that program. The kid wouldn't be in classes and the teacher was really well trained to provide you know, the kind of thinking that and reflection that Ivan is talking about that's not able to be done in an office. I'm not sure why it went away. Perhaps the numbers went way down. I don't know. So that seems like a very specific case for that school site. Um, I would encourage the staff member to work with the site administration. Um, I'm happy to later connect with um, Superintendent Murray about some specific concerns that you may have. Um, but it sounds like it might be just a, in a messy situation that you know. Gonna I'm, I'm going to have to interject here and just say I want to be very cautious of providing identifiers. There's multiple identifiers given to this situation already, and our students have federal protection rights. So if we could wing the conversation away from specifics and keep them much more general, I'll, I'll honor that. But I, I, in this space, I can't honor there's too, there's there's too many specifiers there. Sorry. So one difference when a student has a learning disability is the team attempting to identify whether the behavior is a manifestation of the learning disability. That is just one difference in that scenario, but all education codes for suspension apply to students even when there is a learning disability. Did, yeah, I, and I just encourage you to follow up with Superintendent Sheckman on any specifics, please. Um, didn't want to discourage you from that, just not in this space. I'm sorry? Oh, oh sure, yes, I could agree with that. 
Trustee Flores, did you have some comments or questions? Uh, yeah. Yes. So I just wanted to thank you for this and, you know, our kids feeling safe on campuses of the utmost importance for many of us. Um, and I know the uh, the word around the community is, you know, how the program with the SRO is going so great at Watson High. That's all I hear is that they love it. And I hear about the students and interacting with them and engaging with them. I think it's wonderful. And I think, you know, some our other conference from high schools are hearing this, unfortunately, you know. And so I would, I, I hope the meeting tomorrow goes great. I mm -hmm. hope we can get someone out there for PV because not only do we want to make, have their campus be safe, but we also want them to have that, that culture also and that um, relationship with someone who can help to, up, to uplift them. And I know at, at Plus High, my son attends there. I'm not, I don't hear the same type of culture uh, with their SRO as I do at Watsonville. So uh, hopefully we can maybe try to push out Plus's SRO a little more in that direction. But I know, you know, with it's the P PD versus the sheriff, but I just, I love to hear from so many people in our community how they love how much, how engaging he is with our students. So I'd like to see if maybe we can try to encourage that a little more at Plus High. And Thank you. Get PV High one as well. And Vice President Soka. Good evening, Ivan. Thank you. Thank you for the information. Um, just a question: Can amendments be made to this plan uh, post approval? The answer to that is yes, and like I mentioned it sometimes because some of these parts of the planning have individuals designated as um, leaders of a certain, you know, portion of the plan. So when staffing changes or things change, Program, um, whatever. whatever happens, we do end up going back and making those adjustments so that they're current, right? So whenever someone reviews it and it's needed at that moment in time, we can All take right, a look that, at more current. That, lead, that leads me to my next point. So I had a lieutenant from Santa Cruz Sheriff's Office contact me, and uh, he feels that the Alice plan is anti antiquated and is not compatible with the rest of the county, which is what they work with with other districts. So I, I'm supposing you're the point of contact for something like that. Um, so I'm, I'm going to reach out to him and try to get a line of communication going so that we can see what we could do to uh, to change that plan. He, he sounded genuinely concerned over the fact that, you know, Alice, it is a functional system, but it's not compatible with the county as opposed to the other districts should an incident occur. And, I mean, it will work. We have it internally, but there's there's a level of communication that's missing from other uh, emergency services since they're not connected to that. Yeah, I know that we've been in in conversations with the county office of Ed, who's now um, making adjustments to their um, active shooter and critical incident response. Um, they were in what used to be a very antiquated um, protocol for response. So last year is when they were engaging in dialogue and a new um, protocol was in place with the Santa Cruz Sheriff's Department. Um, I, I wanna remind the board that there was a huge investment with our ALICE protocol and as we've been doing that for about now four or five years and now we're at a point where we're actually training students um, and putting it back in students' you know hands. So shifting to a different protocol would require us to restart the process. Well, well, so let's, just start, let's open that line of communication, see mm -hmm. what it's going to take if, you know, if something does need to be amended or implemented so that we're in compliance and, and fall in line with the rest of the county so that, you know, should, God forbid, something major happen, you know, we're, there's, there's going to be holes in the communication lines. And the emergency aspect of it. And then, uh, do we co collaborate with Monterey County and the SO over there for their specific? Um, Since we have Pajaro Hall and uh, Maloney on the Monterey County side. No, what what we've been routed for our comprehensive safety plan has been the fire department chief Mendoza um, as the individual who's supporting us through um, the review of our comprehensive safety plan. Right. So we have no involvement with the sheriff's office. 
usually it's it's dispatch when we need them and not necessarily but for comprehensive safety plans it's chief mendoza right, from the so, fire department so that'll be another aspect we'll have to get in touch with and, and try to implement as well mm -hmm. i'm going to add one thing in for the excuse um with the alice is that just remind that the alice protocol is for our um for pbusd district employees and students it is what we do until law enforcement gets there. The moment law enforcement gets there, they 100% take over. It's the process that we use to say, stay safe in that time being, and the average response time is five to eight minutes. So that's what we do until law enforcement gets there. But we will definitely start yeah. the, the conversation. I've, I've spoken to several lieutenants, retired lieutenant people that I know over there who kind of had a, a little difference of opinion on that. But uh, yeah, we'll. We'll get that communication going. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President. So, the Trustee Deserta. Um, when we have um, issues or problems and we call dispatch, the SO from Monterey County does respond. My cousin was the um, chief deputy, not the chief. What do you call it? The chief? Like the head guy, the <laughs> sheriff. He was the sheriff. And I actually talked to him, Steve Burnell. Uh, so I had talked to him about could they staff our SRO at Pajaro Valley High School because we had asked our sheriff and he could not staff it. Watsonville couldn't staff it. So I, I thought, well, what the heck? Let's ask Monterey County. They could not staff it either. <laughs> but that was last last year. So I don't know. But I think um, our, you know, like we have a hard time um, recruiting and retaining teachers. Mm -hmm. So does law enforcement because the cost of living here is so high. It's a workforce mm -hmm. issue. Um, so we have no SRO at PD High. In its place, we had had probation professionals helping us mm -hmm. with kids. Are those people still? Because I know that was a big grant that. Yeah, it's still in them. existence. So okay. it's our student success program, as we call it, yeah. with that probation officer. And then even though we don't have an SRO at PD High, we do have the mental health clinician that is paired with that SRO to continue to provide that level of care uh, for students so who are... we do are, have the mental health clinician we in do. place. Okay. Yep. And then we still have the probation professional we on do. campus, too, to keep an eye on the kids that are on, on probation. That's great. Um, so on, on this safety plan, like... We can't really click on any of those areas to see actually what the protocols are. Is that correct? So on part one, which is public, you can see all of the the sections of mm -hmm. the part one. Uh, part two is not public. That's why it's not in there. So you will not, you're not able to see the part two, which is uh, generally speaking our response to emergencies. Probably said that already. I'm sorry if I missed that. Well, the part under ensuring compliance, where it says, like what I was interested in seeing, is protocols to address mental health care of people. Is that something that I cannot click on to see? It, there is if that it's a PDF file that was downloaded. So if maybe you start scrolling down all the way, you might pull that section that has that. Okay, I just I'm seeing it in the presentation, so I'll take a look later. Thank you for that. Um, I think that might be it. Wh when I first came to the district, we didn't have protocols across all schools so that each principal, even if they were brand new, they were sort of interpreting how to be disciplined a little differently. And so we had, as a result, tons and tons of suspensions and expulsions. And we worked on that really hard. And so do you feel like like the training for our new principals and our, our, what we're doing at all the schools is equitable across the district at this point? Yeah, over the last couple of years, we've been uh, collaborating with human resources and other um, district leaders and departments to do more onboarding for our new um, administrators when they get hired. Um, part of that, if they are, you know, responsible for student discipline or um, student services departments at, at the high school levels, for example, we do cover those pieces with them to ensure that there is some level of understanding and common um, practice as we address discipline. So, um, can we always do more? Absolutely. Um, I think that's been always an ongoing thing of myself. I, you know, want to be a, a reach to 
um, all of our site administrators and I am just a phone call away if they're having um, some tough situations happening at their school site. So I'm in consultation with them all the time about specific issues so that I can provide that guidance when they're not feeling 100% sure about what's going on. Okay. And then my last comment is just that one day I was in Houston for a conference and I was driving around and I came upon a motorcade of school district police officers. Like they have their own police forces in Texas. Hmm. like for the district and I, it was shocking to me I was like wow that's a thing so we have a big district I don't know I mean what do other big districts do in in the state I'm just you don't have to answer this now but I'd maybe like to hear about it later mm -hmm. the district our size do we ever have our own little little uh, law enforcement situation anyway you don't no answer needed yeah <laughs> Something like we'll that. spend another that hour about talking about police yeah. on campus. <laughs> Thank you. Trustee DeSerpa, I just asked Superintendent Sheckman to put that in our agenda to work with maybe a future topic to bring up. And he said sure. Um, <laughs> so before I, I want call for motion, Trustee Dr. Holmes, do you have any questions, comments, or anything? I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I'm realizing you and I are the only two haven't spoken. Because I do before I want to call for a motion. I just want to make sure everybody's feeling heard. Um, um, for me. Um, so I heard lots of really great comments from everyone um, tonight up here and really appreciative of that. And I think Trustee Flores said it. I mean, you know, she spoke on behalf of the board. I mean, and I, I th I'd say that also for all of you as administrators and our teachers and our staff. I mean, nobody cares more about the safety the actual physical mm -hmm. safety and well-being of our students and our staff and our faculty on a daily basis. Numerous of us have been, I think, probably getting the same emails because people don't do the BCC, <laughs> right? Right? Um, um, on concerns, particularly centered around PB High School, mm -hmm. right? And that is really concerning. And, and a lot of those concerns are coming from our own employees, teachers, our classified employees, and that's really concerning. Um, I, I do want to echo what Trustee Dodge Jr. said and Trustee Flores said, but heard we missed getting to meet with CJ the day um, Superintendent Checkman and I did our tour there at Watsonville High School. We've heard phenomenal mm -hmm. things about him. I am not surprised. Also, under the leadership of their um, interim principal, Gregorio. Um, so, um, but also the uh, continued echo concerns about PB High School and, it, and it, it just can't, you know, be brushed off. But I also, last night, um, I watched the Watsonville City Council meeting and they have a, a very packed agenda, including a lot about their financials and budgets and one um, particular, a few of Senator, of course, around fire and PD. Mm -hmm. And Chief Zamora was up there speaking, so it would be like some great review before you go to the meeting tomorrow. <laughs> but um, was speaking to this, and, and they, they, he very much so wants to get an SRO at PB High School. That, that helps their budget with the Watsonville PD. So it's not, it really, I want just the community as a whole, and I think most of us up here logically do, it's not for a lack of try at all. I mean, it, it helps them and assists them with their budget, which overall helps our community. None of us are an island end for ourselves in this community. So there is a greater issue. I think what Trustee DeSerpa said, I, I, that sounds like a phenomenal idea. If, I mean, if that's in the direction we're able to move in, I mean, we're one of the largest school districts in the state, the largest in the region, and we've been on a platform to be a leader for many things, not only in the state, but in the nation. So that's why I asked that we could, you know, get that somewhere on the line. But I just really also want to make sure everyone knows that it's it's not for a lack of prior effort. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, again, I think Trustee DeSoto said that, that it's, a, it's the same area we suffer in trying to get talent and teachers. And I think it's the same struggle they're suffering um, both in the PD and the fire department. So mm -hmm. I, just, I just wanted to echo that because I did have that because I don't know, I had nothing better to do last night at 11 o'clock <laughs> at night. I don't know, I'm weird. But um, so, if you don't have nobody else has anything to add, 
I do not have a first, so I'm going to have to call for a first. Make a motion to approve the safety plan. Thank you, Trustee DeSerpa, and thank you, Trustee Flores, for the second. So I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? All right. The vote thank you. Seven zero. And thank you so much for your time. And President now, Acosta, yeah, I, I, I thought we could squeeze one more in, but yeah. I, I feel you. I yeah. know where you're going. And my only thing I'm going to ask you is to recognize how many items we have mm -hmm. left to go back to closed session mm -hmm. before you make your motion. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I recognize... Just to give us... Doesn't mean we'll have to go that full time, but please give us enough time. I, recognizing that we still have two report items and we still have to go back into closed session, I was going to make consent. a motion and consent. I was going to make a motion to extend our meeting to 1230. Thank you. And I'll as second. much as you know, I don't <laughs> like that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants to go home again bed before midnight. Yeah. Uh, so I have a first for the trustee home. I think I second. Flora is seconded. Oh, trustee DeSerpa. I think you had So I have a first and a second to extend the meeting till 1230. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? You do not get a vote, Marie. Um, <laughs> any abstaining? So the vote carries 7-0. So our meeting is now extended till 1230. <laughs> and lucky you, you get to go home before that. <laughs> Our next item, 9.1, the um, update to board policy 6158 for independent study. This is our first read, and this report will be presented by none other than our executive director of teaching and learning, Ms. Peggy Hugh. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening, President Acosta, Interim Superintendent, Mr. Checkman. Our trustees and cabinet, thank you so much. And the good news is that I majored in clarity and I minored in brevity, so watch out. Here we go. <laughs> so tonight I'm bringing to you tonight for our first read, proposed changes to our board policy 6158 regarding independent study. The reason for this proposed change, which you saw in the little description in the packet, um, we haven't had an update to our board policy for many years and assembly bills over the last few years have made substantive changes to existing education code regarding independent studies and districts, including ours, began implementing those in 22-23 school year. So some of the language adjustments um, that are included in the education code, it's language adjustments, clarifications, definitions, and then of course some updates to the code itself. Um, specific, some of those updates are specific guidelines for short term, which is less than 15 days, and long term, more than 15 days, independent study for students. The new ed code creates provisions for districts to help address chronic absenteeism through re-engagement strategies. And the policy also provides specific guidance regarding the claiming of apportionment for traditional independent study. ADA for apportionment is based on the time value of student work products. And it's a combination of the time value of the work product and participation in synchronous instruction. So much has changed over the, the last many years in the world of um, independent study since PBUSD has updated its policy, including education code. And so we worked collaboratively with the uh, school board association to uh, take their recommendations for an update for our independent study, which is what um, was attached in the board doc that you have before you are our current board policy and then the proposed change. Any questions? Do we have any public speakers to this item? No, we do not. All right, seeing that, I will bring it back to the board. Any questions, comments? Minor, yeah, major and a minor. Oh, okay, I'm gonna, uh -huh. and, and again, so this is just for important discussion, but I do, I do have a question. Sure. Um, so is this is an independent study, does this pertain as well to our um, independent and dependent charter schools? Or is this just? This is, yes, for the. Because they, like for Pacific Coast Charter. Yes. Has, it's known for their independent study program. They are a dependent, dependent. charter school. Right, so yes. can you just elaborate on that for our, because we have what, three now independents? Three independent? I believe, and then the rest are dependent, I believe. Yes. So uh, our board policy pertains to um, all schools, 
And so this, the board policy will um, per pertain to any of our schools. So it would include our dependent charter schools, right? Yes. But not necessarily our independents, right? Right, but this, so this is based on California Education Code and they still have to follow California Education Code. Okay, all right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for the elaboration. Anyone else? No, I'll make a motion to approve. Oh, we don't need a motion. Oh, approach. it's first read. <laughs> it's probably going to come back. It will come back at a regular board All meeting. right. Thank you, Peggy. Thank yeah, you so welcome. much. Thank you for helping elaborate. Then moving to item 9.2, our 2023-2024 LCAP mid-year update. This report will be presented by none other than our superintendent of secondary education, Ms. Lisa Okeri. Welcome. Good evening, Good President Costa. Good evening, President Costa, Board of Trustees, um, and Interim Superintendent, Mr. Shackman, if you're still here. Um, this evening I am presenting the um, LCAP mid-year update report. As a reminder, our LCAP, um, we write the LCAP to improve outcomes for our students. We have um, actions, outcomes, and metrics. So this past year, in 2023, there's a new Senate bill that um, provided that all LEAs must provide an update to the LCAP and by on or before February 28, 2024. So we got it in. And uh, this is the third year of a three year LCAP. So this started in 2021. This is our last year of this um, plan. So as a reminder, we do have nine LCAP goals. The first one being the increasing the number of students who are from TK 12 students performing at or above grade level. Second one is with our CTE offerings and designs. Third one's visual and performing arts. The fourth one, staffing materials and facilities. The fifth one being the English language learner proficiency. Sixth is school culture and student connectedness. Seventh is family engagement. The eighth is with students with disabilities. And the ninth is with our uh, focus on our foster youth. So one of the things that we have that we show um, is our budget, the amount of funds that we receive from the state. Um, when we adopted the uh, LCAP in June, which also came with the adoption of our budget, uh, the state hadn't finalized their budget. So there is a change to the um, the dollar amount that we did receive in our LCFF funding. So the process for the mid-year funding is that we need to look at the um, outcomes of our students at this point. We need to look at uh, the expenditures that we have done and also the different um, metrics. So one of the things that we wanted to look at, um, some of our metrics, this is using our NWA math assessment. On the screen, this is for math. What you'll notice is the blue line to the far right is where we are as of this point. So this was actually in January, so halfway through the school year. The um, bar that's on the far, far left of each of the sections, the green bar, represents 2018-2019. Um, I just wanted it as a reference point of where we were before we went to pandemic. The middle bar, right, the light green, is where we were last year at the end of the school year. So this is percent of students making one year of academic growth or more. So as you can see this year, we've had great um, growth in our math and we still have time to increase this percentage by the, by the um, year's end. For reading, we do see a similar trend where um, the growth that students, students, the percent of students making one year's growth or more in reading is outperforming what we did um, last year at the end of the school year. And so once again, it's the blue bar that is for this year for the mid-year. If we look at the students performing at or above grade level, um, this is for our eighth grade students in math. This is one of the things that we look at. The um, bottom bar is 2018-19 before the pandemic. The middle bar is where we were at the end of the school year last year. And the top bar is where we are now. The top bar is the percent which still can increase by the end of the school year. If we look at reading inside our LCAP, we look at third, fifth, and eighth grade reading for our students. Um, and this is for a percent of students at or above grade level in reading. Once again, on the far left, 2018-19, um, the middle bar is where we were at the end of the school last year, 
and the um, light blue bar is where we are currently at the, the half of the year. Um, one thing I wanted to note, the eighth grade, our current students that are in eighth grade, they had not received the SIPS um, instruction that we do now with our science of reading. And so this, our cohort, our current sixth graders, are our group of students who went through the SIPS um, science of reading instruction. And so if we look the third grade, we still have time that we will surpass last year's um, the percent of students that are reading at or above grade level in third grade. Moreover, we look at school attendance rate, you'll see that we are moving in the right direction. We're not close, well, we're close to where we were um, pre-pandemic, but as you can see, we are trending um, in the positive direction for our students who are attending school. And conversely, chronically truant students, um, we are also trending in the, the correct way where we have less percentage of students who are identified as chronically truant. The stars are where we said that we wanted to be at the end of the three year. The uh, LCAP was written um, right um, kind of during the pandemic because then it came out of it. So we had, we will get there one day. Um, another part of it is looking at the metrics um, met. These are some of the things that were 100% done, completed. We met the goal that we set out to do, the outcome. Um, so expulsion rates, seven out of seven subgroups the expulsion rates are lower than uh, lower than what we had said last year. They were lower than what we wanted them to be at our three-year outcome, and currently this year they are lower than the, what they were last year. Um, certificated staffing, um, as you know, we actually had positive this year with certificated staffing in the classroom. Um, implementation of purchasing practices for solvent fiscal um, practices. The number of school-wide family engagement that we've held on every single school site. So um, the Family Engagement Center, uh, Family Engagement Department has done an extremely great job in, in offering, helping school sites to really develop their plans. Um, and so we've already met that goal. And that's increased all three years. The percent of preschool students ready for kindergarten, we've met that goal. Um, and then a lot of, and some other ones that are up there. For our second semester, we have a focus based on looking at um, where we are right now, our second semester focus of where we are right now, identify which schools are not meeting the target that we've set for students having at least one year's growth in reading, and then it helped to implement a plan. The multi-tiered systems of support, the training and the implementation continuing to do this to help support each student so that they receive um, the services that they need. Student attendance and engagement to continually increase our number of students that are attending school. Recruitment and support for highly, highly qualified, classified and certificated staff so we can start next year on another positive note. Evaluation of instructional curriculum and programs. What we have in place, is it working? This year, um, there were some items that we did um, take off the plate because we didn't see that it was working. We weren't going to put that extra stress on our um, staff that's on with our students. And then the last thing is work with school sites to build out um, master schedules. This is at all levels, elementary, middle, and high, to allow for equal and equitable access for foster youth, English learners, and students with disabilities. So in the next steps, um, we have the Youth Truth Survey that just closed. We have to disaggregate the data. Um, the end of the year results for Stone to Grow, disaggregate the data, see what we need to do, enhance the family engagement plans, continue to refine professional development for individual choice and accountability. This is for our certificated staff to make sure that everybody has a voice in what we do. Continue to work with the LCAP Advisory Committee to develop the new three-year LCAP plan, and then hold the public meeting on June 12th for the new LCAP plan, and then approval on June 26, 20, 2024. We do have some schools that will be in the new LCAP plan that are CSI eligible, which means that they had three um, areas in red and they're for different reasons, whether it was for attendance, the, their attendance rate, suspension rates, whether it was for EL progress, for um, English language arts or math. These are the schools that are listed here on this slide. They will be included in our new LCAP plan to make sure that we are supporting. And with the results that we're seeing now, I'm sure that next year, 
some of these schools will um, be taken off the CSI list. And that is the end of the mid-year report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gary. And, uh, do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. <laughs> Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for discussion. Any questions or comments or discussion from the board? Thank you. I have a question about the metrics slide. If you could go back. Which one? Um, okay. Metric net. Oh. So we had a metric regarding expulsion rates and and we done better than what our metric was? Or? Yes. So what at the beginning when it was first written, we looked at our expulsion rate. Mm -hmm. We um, identified a goal, an outcome of what we wanted with our metric to be at the end of the three years. Um, that percentage and I can pull it up, it's in my binder, that percentage, what it is, at the end of last year, we were under that expulsion rate that we wanted, and this year we are lower than what it is. And what we do is we build it out, um, we have listed the subgroups of our students. And so all seven of the seven subgroups that we have listed in the um, LCAP plan um, met that metric where the expulsion rate is under what we wanted it to be. Okay, that's great. And then, um, can you go backwards? the blue. Yeah. So that's our map assessment. This is for students leading at or above grade level. Yeah, cool. And then I like I like the first one that we made. Okay, just with all the different blue ones. So there we go. I just want to look at it for a second. Mm -hmm. okay. So Oh, I see. Okay, so 2018-2019 is pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. And that was the last year that we had um, three, we had three periods of NWA assessment um, results. Because the following year we... Okay, so that looks, that data looks pretty good, right? Yes, it does. Right? It's excellent. It does look good, and we are trending the in the right direction. the of the eighth grade, and you said that's the cohort that didn't get sick. Yes, and they were in fifth grade um, doing the at home during that the year that we were online, sure. so and in fourth grade sense. they left. Yeah. Okay. So that is the year, but we still have we we are set to outperform what we did last year. That's great. Do you mind advancing one forward? Oh, those attendance rates. Yes. Do we have any map? Um, numbers up there? Yes. Yeah, so Sorry, the one. I missed that. No, that's fine. So we have two. This is um, students. Um, performing at or above grade level in math. In the LCAP, we have the eighth grade as our marker to look to see how our students are doing eighth grade. In eighth grade, mm -hmm. um, it's the same where or looking at it, our students are outperforming what we had before the pandemic and doing um, better than last That's year. That's great. Congratulations to everybody's hard work mm -hmm. on that. That's really great. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll make a motion to approve. Nope. No. It's just a report. <laughs> Any other discussion from the board? All right, thank you, thank you, Gary. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, so seeing none, I will now take us to item 10, our consent agenda. Um, these are items that are routine items coming before the board. Do we have any public speakers to the consent agenda? We do not. Are there any items that the board wishes to defer? Seeing none, can I, I have a I'm so sorry, I do. I have one. Okay. And it is uh, Rolling Hills, I think, the track and field. Which one? Can you tell mm. me which number? I'm sorry. It is 10.8, Rolling Hills. Oh, 10.8? So mm -hmm. you'd like to defer 10.8? Please. Just that one? That's it. Okay, would you make a motion to the effect? Make a motion to approve um, fully item 10.9. 10 10.8? Sorry, 10.8. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry. So I have a motion. To approve consent agenda as presented with deferring item 10.8. Can I have a second? I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Great. The motion carries 7-0. Now we will move to item 10.8, the approval of the architect agreement for Rolling Hills Middle School Track and Field Project number 2024-012.
Hello, mic check. How's everybody doing? Good, Good morning, Thank I would you. say, to wake you up. You know, <laughs> here we are, we're gonna go to 12.30, you know? Stay for a little longer. Yes, yes, well. Um, I'm gonna defer to Trustee Bistrico since she asked to defer this item and see what her questions or comments are for this night. Yes. Thank you, so in the backup that I'm looking at, it doesn't tell me where this money is coming from. Can you tell me where the $4 million is? Yes, so 3.5 million is coming from Watsonville, the city of Watsonville. We're working with the Department of Recreation, Parks and Recreation, with Nick, I can't say his last name. Yeah, Coloba Quib. Hopefully I did him justice. Nick. Yes, Nick, really good friend of ours. Uh, so he had taken to the board of the city of Watsonville and processed this, and he had turned over to us a letter of intent with the amounts listed there. I don't see that this item per se includes that letter of intent but it is $3.5 million. Yes. And then inclusive too, Rolling Hills has $500,000 of Measure L funds available, which we're using to start the process and get an architect on board. And so, so I've done work with the county before on a very tiny scale compared to what you're talking about. Yes. And I had to have an MOU, and there were certain conditions that the district needed to meet to like, have the field or the playground open for the public, et cetera. Do you know what the conditions are? Yes. I'm, and, and it's just very curious to me. I've never heard the city of Watsonville give this much money to the district for anything. I mean, it was like pulling teeth to get $100,000 from them for the culinary uh, garden kitten kitchen yeah yeah and I believe so this is uh, shocking to me yeah Kim Sins can attest to you yes. and will the fields be open for like um, soccer Softball league or, or yes, what yeah what is what are some of the conditions for as the time being they'll go ahead and use and the fields are you being able to be utilized but this is for us to at least one test take the feasibility of the project identify long lead items and the cost of construction and allow us to figure out the schedule of when we can start the construction so the architect will allow us to interpret those items to come uh, yeah and start the DSA paperwork as you know the state is very stringent on some of the construction we do for the schools Yeah, yeah, another another similar one that we've done in the past with alongside an MOU and the city of Watsonville has been EA Hall. We have done that track and field with them. And also opportunity to potential, which I've been talking to Herlino about and approaching the city of Watsonville for, is the Pajaro Middle School track and field. They are interested in coming and presenting to us the idea of extending funds for some of our various school sites to utilize some of their funds along with us to, you know, up play, upgrade playgrounds and uh, utilize those funds in that matter too. Okay, well, this is this is great. This is yeah. wonderful. And thank you to the city council and the staff in the Parks and Rec Department for proposing this um, for our schools. It's great. Yeah, yeah, it's really awesome. Before you might move to make a motion, was there, I, I think a few trustees have a question before we get a motion on the table. Any other questions before a motion? I know I had questions. Do you have another? You just want to. Uh, yes. So my my question is: You spoke to the letter of the intent. How come that's not here in the backup on this? I believe. Yeah, yeah, I believe there is. So I yeah. uh, so and I don't know. Maybe. Um, yeah. CBO Sims might want to speak to this. I'm not yes, sure. Yeah. I just want to understand before somebody jumps to make a motion on this, since Trustee the Circus brought and. Uh, an awareness about this. Can I say something it, quickly? It's just for the architect. That's right, correct. but That's correct. right, the four million on the hook, though, if the three point five million for some reason doesn't come through, 
And we approved this tonight. The district's still on the hook for this. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And that cost is out of this. That's correct. So, okay. Yes. So we do have measure. Right. Got it. I, I got it. I'm just wanting to make sure that the district's not on the hook for something that no. we're banking on and no, we don't have, not. and you know that would be not a fiscally sound decision for us to make as yes, trustees. Yes, of course. Okay. Thank no. Thank you for the clarification. I yes. think Trustee Deserpa did want something else to say. I'll just make a motion to approve. I have a first. Can I have a second? I have a first and second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Uh, see none. The item carries 7 0. At this point, I will now close um, our closed session and the board will reconvene. Um, I'm sorry, we'll now close public session. The board will reconvene to close session at 10 36.
Yes, there are. Uh, from February 28, board meeting for Pajaro Valley Unified School District. Motion number one, closed session item 2.1. Under closed session agenda item 2.1, the vote or the board voted 601 to uphold the district's response to an employee complaint appeal. Motion number two, closed session item 2.2. So I move to approve the Certificated Personnel Report as presented by District Administration on February 28, 2024 with eight and 26 additional action items. Can I get a second? I'll second. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 that we stopped there. Um, I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries 7-0. Motion number three, closed session item 2.3. I move to approve the classified personnel report as report as presented by district administration on February 28, 2024 with eight and seven additional action items. May I ask for a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries 7-0. All right, we have announcement or one announcement this evening. Uh, Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Martin Gutierrez as the new principal of Hall Elementary School. Mr. Gutierrez began his teaching career at Hall District Elementary School as a classroom teacher in 2008. He also served as a summer school lead teacher and after school coordinator. He began his administrative career as an assistant principal at the Alisal Community School he served as a principal of Barden Elementary School from 2018 to 2024 and is currently serving as an administrator of extended learning for Alisal School District. Mr. Gutierrez earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in Political Science from UC Davis, his multiple subject credential from CSUMB, both his Master's in Education and his administrative credential were earned at San Jose State. He's currently enrolled in an educational doctorate program at San Jose State with an emphasis in educational leadership. We're excited to welcome this highly accomplished administrator to Hall District Elementary. Go Hawks. All right, and next are... Oh yeah. Yeah, we have, I got oh, two sorry. more. Oh. Oh. There are two more items to report okay. out uh, from closed session. Closed session item 2.8 regarding resolution number 23-24-24. The board approved the non-reelection of two FTE certified probationary employees with the vote of 7-0. Uh, employee ID 97, oh, you want to read the employee IDs? No? Okay. So closed session item 2.11 regarding resolution 23-24-26. The board approved the possible release, reassignment, or non-reelection of certain certified management employees with a vote of 7-0. And that is all. Thank you, Vice President Soto. Moving to item 14.1, our upcoming board meetings. Our next special, our next meeting is a special study session tomorrow, February 29th at 6 p.m. right here on declining enrollment. I look forward to seeing you all here. Um, and the next regular board meeting will be on March 13th. I now adjourn this meeting at 11.22 p.m. Thank you. And thank you all for being here tonight for this very important meeting.